This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. Well, it's okay. I'll tell this story. You ready for this, Zeke? I'm ready. Okay. Then I'm going to introduce you as soon as I tell you the story. Okay. We had a historian on the show, Elliot West, and then he was on, and then Elliot West um, was on Rogan's show. And I listened, and that guy is so good that he talked about totally different stuff. One of the things they were talking about is the term big wig. He's a big wig. You ever hear that term? Yeah. Okay. It used to be so, uh, such a disgrace to be bald that you would wear a wig made of human hair, horse hair, because it was so disgraceful to be bald. The king of France goes bald. He gets a wig. Then everybody's like, now I want a wig. Turn the tide. So then all of a sudden, people that weren't even bald were wearing wigs. It'd be like you look up to Jeff Bezos, full head of hair, but you shave your head. You follow me? Yeah. Zeke Thurston. (laughs) That's a good episode. He's tracking the whole damn deal. Uh, Rodeo rider, bronc riding specialist, won how many times? The uh, con- uh, just won my fourth Canadian title and uh, won three world titles. So you, you're, the, I mean, tell, how good are you? You know, that, that's <laughs> not that's not too shabby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, we're gonna talk a bunch about that, but I gotta talk about one thing. Is I saw you, um, as much as you excel in your in your discipline in rodeo, I saw you get demoted this morning on decoy. Yeah putting out i was setting the decoys out wrong yeah and he actually got, was putting the duck stands on the goose decoys. yeah and i saw you well you and i both made a mistake we both took the carabiners off early and got tangled up rat's nest had a rat's nest um we had to get bailed out of that and then you made a second mistake you unbagged yeah, I unbagged you. You unbagged, early. and then I saw you get demoted. I didn't. I didn't realize and the you got, goose decoy etiquette. You got take. You got totally taken off the job. I did. I felt embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, "You know, is this be- one of your compliment sandwiches, but without no, the first listen, half? You would know. It's an open face. You would. Know, you could take a hundred people. Okay, if if, if uh, we were hunting with Brady Davis and Matt McCormick, uh." who've been on a number of times, the Flying V guys, and you, no disrespect, Brady's here, no disrespect. You could take, not 100, you could take a dozen people and say, like, how should we put the decoys out? And I don't know that, like, 12 of them aren't gonna, right, 12 of them aren't gonna have the same system. But you got very rigid in the system. Mm -hmm. So there's a dozen on a carabiner, you take the carabiner off the hook, and you go out, and you place, just place the bags in the right place. Then, when that's done, you place a stand by each bag. When that's done, you go and take them out of the bag and put them on the stand and put all the bags into the yellow bag. And the yellow bags get hung up, but don't put them on the wrong stand. And when you take them in, you put a bag, right? It's the whole way of doing it. And and we screwed up and 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 uh and yeah they just came in and uh, and said uh, to Zeke he said Matt McCormick said you know it'd be a better job for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I, like, I did <laughs> notice that I untangled my own rat's nest you let Matt take yours over oh you got yours all undone mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. He follows through is what he's saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I felt a little emasculated when you he just I felt emasculated you, you, you when he, when the he mess und- and then just yeah. dipped out left. He took it over and untangled my rat's nest, and I had to stand there like a child <laughs> yeah. and watch yeah. him. He, he reached into his pocket and gave you a lolly. He <laughs> said, hey, this might be fun. Look. Can, no, I, can I tell you the behind the scenes after that happened, right? So Matt and I are setting up decoys. So the, the way we got to this system is by just hundreds of days on the road together, right? Mm-hmm. So you just, you kind of figure out, you got the core group of guys that know the system. And then when you have guests hunting, you just kind of get in where you fit in, right? Yeah. But after that happened with you two today, we're we're over there and we'll set out the decoys. And then Matt and I, at some point, will always like reconvene. You move this one that six inches yeah. and that one an inch. But we'll like yeah. reconvene when everybody's doing the thing. It's just he and I. It's like, all right, what, how you feeling? Like, what are you thinking? We Everything looking good here? And he goes... You know what would be a really awesome thing to have in the next goose trailer? Because we're we're building a new one for next year, way bigger, right? And I said, What's that? And he goes, We need a whiteboard. I said, Okay. And he's like, Imagine if in the morning before everybody just shotguns approached this whole thing, we just took five minutes, oh, opened the door, out. and on the whiteboard, it's like, we draw it out, and then we can say, Zeke, you're doing this. Garrett, you're doing this. Steve, you're doing this. Brady, you're doing he's like Dude, just be like sports, right? Like coach has a whiteboard, comes up the playbook, and it'll take us five minutes when we first get to the field. But he's like, I've been thinking about it this morning, and I think it'll save lots of time. With I would put yardages on it. Yardages for so sure. So when you draw a basic picture, you're like, from here to here, that's going to be about 50 yards. Mm-hmm. This is going to be about 10 yards. Great idea. And then you got like your your reserve players, right? Where you're like, you guys <laughs> yeah. are going to be sitting here yeah. in the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Steve, just Steve, be ready to go. Steve I need Zeke, you, to Steve and Zeke. You guys go ahead and have a cup of coffee. Well, we were, <laughs> we were gamers. We just started grabbing stuff, but we was doing it wrong. No, which which we appreciate because a lot of times when you have people come hunt with you, it can be a little overwhelming when you look at this trailer, right? And so people will come and just go, I don't know what to do. Like it's everybody's just moving, so you just kind of sit. So to your point, I do like you're a gamer. Like you guys will get in and get dirty and. I got get stuff I got yelled at right away because I unhooked the blinds wrong, and Brady came into the trailer talking to Dane with me standing right behind him. He Didn't goes, realize you were there, and he goes, "No, he knew I was there." And he goes, mm. uh, "Somebody did this that clearly doesn't understand our system," mm. mm-hmm. and his name is Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, you don't screw around with Matt and Brady." Well, you don't want to be the guest that uh, doesn't participate it's in, a in all sword. that work. It's a double-edged 100%. sword, dude. The other no. option is you just stay there and watch, <laughs> and then later they talk about how you didn't help. Yep. No, so uh, <laughs> to, you're exactly useless. right. I would rather have somebody that, like, helps too much and makes a rat's, ne- rat's nest out of the, you know, decoy bags. Like, that's better than standing with your then hands in your pockets. Sitter. Because, and Zeke and I talked about it, the way we set up on these hunts, there is a pile of decoys and a pile of work. Like, a lot of gear, right? It takes takes time to get it all out and There's a lot of stuff in that trailer get it all picked up and so we are very much appreciative of those who get their hands dirty and get to work brady i was surprised to learn that you studied bronc riding under zeke's father i did yeah do you guys use the term study yeah i don't know if it'd be study maybe like learned i guess yeah um I think an appropriate term for me would I I got my head drove in the dirt a thousand times <laughs> yeah. while Zeke's dad watched me and tried to give me pointers. What's your dad's name? Skeeter. Skeeter. Yeah, and he's American. Yes. What what state was he Nebraska. from? Nebraska. Nebraska. Born and raised Sand Hills. So you got a foot in each. You got a foot on each side of the line. Yeah. You got a Canadian mother and a and an American father. But you know how, you know Americans have somewhat. I don't know if you caught on to this somewhat myopic view of the world. It always surprises me to hear that there's like a rodeo guy in Canada because we think that we sort of own everything. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. We're like, even up there. But it's a thriving culture up there. Yeah, it's uh, especially like, you know, Alberta, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Western side. It's um, it's huge. Um, it's uh, it's a big industry up there. Um, some of the some of the best uh, rodeo contestants come from there. Um, buck and horses, the, the whole born to buck program was started up there. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, yeah, it's deeply rooted. Is uh is it is there a regionality to the different uh events? Jimmy, I mean, you, like you mentioned that, right? Is there like a barrel <laughs> racing mecca, a bronc mecca? Kinda, I mean, not not necessarily, but like I would say like like me and Brady were talking on the way over here. Like for example, like if you want to be a calf roper, like Texas, Louisiana, your southern states are kind of where you'd want to be. Like is that right? Yeah, yeah just because it it requires so much time. 
um, so much practice. Like them guys can rope 365 days of the year. Oh. Where if you're from Alberta, you got to have an indoor barn, um, you know, to go rope from probably this time of the year till mid-May. You know what I heard recently that surprised me that's similar to that is someone saying that it's like that rich kids always do better in skiing. And immediately you think, well, it's because they go to the big ski hills that are expensive to go to. But it's the rich kids are always going to kick everybody's ass because they go to New Zealand for the summer. Well, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So if your family's loaded, you're just you're going to ski 365 yeah. days yeah. a year. If you're broke, you're going to ski when you got winter. You can't chase the snow. Yeah. I don't know if that's Riding always true, but it's just summer. like sort of generally true, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then like, I don't know, like Al- Alberta, like Canada is definitely known for their bronc riders, um, known for their, you know, quality of buck and horses. Um, and those but, two things go hand in hand. Mm-hmm, yeah, for sure. But I don't, I mean, you can be from anywhere and do, do any event or discipline you want. And you're a mule deer hunter. Mule deer hunter, whitetail hunter. You like hunting deer. Yeah. Not a big, not huge on waterfowl. Uh, I, I actually, I saw I, that I'd, this morning, the way you handled a decoy string. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I actually yeah, had a blast. I've just never, here, I've right. just never done hey, much you got the it. only bird, dude. Yeah. We had a slow morning. Yeah, we did. You got the only bird. But and we when we skunked. cleaned him, what did we find? I don't know. He had what a hole fun? through his heart. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, I did. Your heart shot him. A lot better than Brady's turkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Brady's the, the invincible turkey. We heard a story this morning about an invincible turkey. All right, we're going to get back. We're going to talk about what it takes to be an eight-time Wrangler National Finals rodeo qualifier and a three-time world champion. Uh, let me Before we – I'm going to leave you and then come back to you, but let me ask you this. What's an old bronc rider? Oh, like – Billy Epbauer, probably the most legendary bronc rider. Um, I think his last NFR, he was maybe like 40, and you have to fact check this, but 45 to 40, somewhere in there. But that's, that's, that's extraordinary. That's old. He's an outlier. You're long now, in the are tooth. You, you're are, long, to, long in the tooth if you're. So at 29, where are you? Are you in the middle? Are you toward the autumn? Where, do, where are you You at? know, it just, I mean, it's kind of a personal preference. Um, you know, as long as you're competitive and, uh, you know, keep yourself, um, you know, where you, where you want to be, you can, you can probably ride Bronx as long as you want to. What all bones have you broken? Oh, I've broken, I've been pretty lucky in that, that department. I've, I broke my femur uh, in high school riding bulls. I've broke some ribs. Uh, I broke my ankle at the college finals. Um, knocked all my teeth out once, but, uh. Doing what? Uh, I was riding steers. And you got kicked by a hoof? No, I took a horn in the face. Oh, a horn did it? Yeah. How many teeth did it knock out? 13. So was you that just, just like inc- fake teeth? In your head now? No, there was. I was. I was eight, <laughs> and oh. uh, so it was all my. It was all my baby teeth still. But that's. Uh, yeah. Oh no. So was you're it, losing them anyway. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, they're going anyway. Just saved him time. Just yeah, them exactly. Didn't have Hell, the hell of a night for the tooth. Oh yeah, the tooth yeah. Yeah, he he pulled, trips. pulled thirteen bucks that night. Yeah, 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 instead uh-huh. of spreading it all out over yeah. all those yeah. years, you know, you just got all that ch- money. You can invest that way if we get it all in one lump sum. Uh, we'll come back to that, but I, I don't want to hit every time we have a professional athlete in, I like to try to hammer around this, like the, the life expectancy thing, mm-hmm. because the interesting thing about athletes is you get like, uh, you get such a second act. Do you know what I mean? When, like when you're, so. well, I mean, the, if you're in a thing where you're going to wrap it up when you're 40, Right, you look. You look at most people that that dedicate themselves to some career. They're planning on. I mean, they're like, I don't know. I'll do this till I'm seventy, sixty-five, seventy. Mm-hmm. But to have it be that you can come out of one career and still have a lot of years ahead of you, you're still sharp mentally. Maybe in your case, you'd be a little bit beat up physically, but you also look be like, man, I got forty more years on the planet. And you go into, you just change gears. You go, you, you, you do some other thing. Yeah. Now, in your case, you might go into teaching, but it's just interesting to be in a situation where here you are, you spent your whole life trying to become like the best in the world at something and you sacrifice everything to do it. And then you get to this age, which is relatively young, meaning I'm, I'm 49, I'm out, right? And then all of a sudden you start some whole new... A whole new endeavor. Yeah, I mean, it's like, chapter, you're like, right? you're like, what am I going to do? Do next, yeah. 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 And, and I think it can make, it's make some people go mad. For sure. And some a, people are a good lot about of, it. A lot of people struggle with that, too. Um, you know, and in, in not in just rodeo, but all sports. Like, because when you make your living with your body, you have a shelf life yep. for, for only so long, you know. And then, you, like you said, you've poured everything you've ever had in into this one thing. And then you're, you know, when it's all over, you kind of 
so you know some seems like some guys almost kind of lose their identity or sure without you know that drive or that that one thing that made them tick you know yeah you see it with people in the mil people that retire from the military because you got guys that are getting 20 years into the military and they're under 40 in some cases and you just like wake up one day and you got to like make a new yeah go, go a different direction yeah you got to find like a whole new dragon to slay yep. you know i can yep. just picture it being challenging we'll, we'll come back and talk about some of that stuff uh, new audio project is out January 9th. Now get this. We've talked about this a thousand times, but we haven't talked about it. I haven't talked about it to the level of detail I'd like to. So we are, if you are familiar with our previous audio originals, we've done a number here at Meat Eater. We've done a number of audio originals. We did our Close Calls series, um, Close Calls Volume 1, Close Calls Volume 2. We're working on a Volume 3 of that, but we started this new series, this new project called Meat Eater's American History. And... For the first one, we are doing Meat Eaters American History, The Long Hunters. So the way I can always connect people to what a long hunter was is Daniel Boone um, is the most famous long hunter. Everybody knows Daniel Boone was some kind of frontiersman or explorer, or pioneer, whatever. What Daniel Boone really was, like how that guy made his living, he's made his living supplying the... He made his living working in the whitetail deerskin trade. At that time, through all these, all these uh, socioeconomic, geopolitical reasoning reasons, there was a tremendous demand in Europe for American deerskins, and the good deerskins, the good numbers of deerskins, came from the places you weren't supposed to go. And the long hunters, like Daniel Boone, were these guys that would go on long hunts. And they died like flies trying to participate in the deerskin trade. As we explain in our audiobook, which is called Meat Eaters American Histories, The Long Hunters. As we explain in this, this is like the, the, the way we're looking at American history and, and market hunting and commercial hunting is dicing it up in these very fine pieces. The long hunter era, basically, as we'll explain this thing you'll learn, the long hunter era goes from 1760 to 1776. Why does it have such a tight bracket? You'll learn all about why the height of American deer hunting was bracketed by those dates, 1760, 1776. 1776 might ring a bell in your little noodle there because it was uh, American independence, right? So you'll hear the whole story about the deer hide trade. In it, we cover why deer hides, what was going on with them. We cover the beginning of the bracket. We cover the end of the bracket. We cover the gear used by the long hunters. We cover how they processed and handled hides. We cover how they died. We cover the interactions they had with native hunters on the landscape. A lot of bloodshed, a lot of mayhem. It's a phenomenal story and it's like this is because i've always liked to read about boone i've always liked to read about the long hunters this is all of the information that i wish i had had like if i had found this somewhere we wouldn't have made this we made it because it's all this shit when you're reading these normal joe blow biographies about these people who are coming from people who don't hunt and they don't know what's interesting so as you read their books, you're always like, well, you should be explaining this, but they don't realize what's interesting. A lot of biographers don't. But I worked on it with Clay Newcomb and Dr. Randall Williams, and we were able to set out and be like, what are the things you don't learn that you wish you learned when you read these books? And that's what this is. This is the stuff for people who like to do things with their hands and understand how shit works. Why? Like when you killed a deer, what did you do with the deer? How did you prepare the deer for transport? Right? It's, it's everything packed in to it's about five or six hours. Meat eaters, American history, the long hunters from the long hunters. We're going to move on to the Rocky mountain beaver trappers. Um, the mountain man era, which is also tightly bracketed. Let's say 1810 to 1834. From there, I don't know. We might go back to Clovis or we might go forward to the Buffalo Hide Hunters and then perhaps on to the Whalers. Not sure yet. Um, a lot of this depends on you and your willingness to go out and buy this damn book. You can buy it right now. It's available for pre-order. The more you pre-order, 
the quicker we'll get the green light to go and continue making it and, and cover everything off. You'll know that we've been successful when we get to the plume hunters, the guys who hunted shorebirds like egrets and flamingos and other things in order to supply feathers for the women's hat trade. Uh, this is real. This, this is, I can't stop thinking about this. The, <sighs> okay. I'm interested to get your take on this. It's so stupid. I don't it's think so, it is. Oh my God, is it stupid? Corinne, you're going to have to weigh in Let's on this. Let's have a debate, guys. It's so stupid. The American Ornithological Society. Who who goes first? You want to tell us why it's smart first? Or no, do I tell why it's I stupid say, first? Say the should, thing. I think you should just explain happening. it. The American Ornithological Society is now in the process of renaming all bird species currently named after people along with any other bird names deemed offensive or exclusionary to the tune where they're going to rename some 70-some birds. Now, I'll start by saying why it's dumb, or Yanni starts by saying why it's smart. Wait, let us let me just, uh, since Brody's not here, I'm just going to say what Brody said. Brody says, pretty soon they're going to have to think of a non-denominational name for the cardinal. Maybe a little red bird with a pointy hat. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. Right, because the cardinal is named after a Catholic a, authority figure. Right. That's not going to last. I, I would imagine it might not. But you think it's great. I, don't, I didn't say I thought it was great, but I think, it, I think there's some... After, did you read the article? I mean, there were some I've people... I've read not just this, but a lot of other coverage of okay, it. Okay, I mean, there's some so people... You, are you starting? There's some people that also were against it, like heavy birders, heavy people involved in... Oh, and they're like, or, well, at first I didn't like it, but now I, it's like they got with the program. They got with the program. Yeah, yeah. They understood. I don't care what they say. Um, I, I think for us, being white males, mm -hmm. that skews our view of things like this uh, big time. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that you or I have ever felt excluded from a lot of these things that we do um, in the outdoors that Exclu we've made. Excluded? Yeah. You know, my buddy, I uh, was telling this whole story to my buddy Alex yesterday, and he said, um, he goes, that's right, man. When I look up a bird and realize it's named after a white guy, I always think, go team. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't they, don't they say in here that uh, one of these birds is like named after Hitler? Like if, if we can all agree on something. Well, I'll, I'll, I haven't given my <laughs> spiel yet. My spiel isn't just the eye roll. It's like a, I have a real spiel. Now, I, oh. something I didn't think about, but it was mentioned in this article that I think uh, would make it much easier just to be a general birder as opposed to being like having to remember that the Gamble's quail has such and such characteristics. Mm -hmm. If they change the name to reflect those characteristics, it would be easier for me to remember and then in the future identify that bird. I agree. They should have done that in the past. They should have done that in the past. Okay. The mule deer is a great example. It's got big ears like a mule. Got it. Mm -hmm. But the coos deer, um, mm -hmm. it just sucks that it got that guy's name, but that's its name. Are you... yeah, I'm done. I mean, oh. please, please okay, tell here, us here's, why. It's here's, here's my issue. I used to play ball with the American Ornithological Society. When the American Ornithological Society came in and said, you know what, we've been calling these birds blue grouse, but in fact, we're capturing these two divergent species when we say blue grouse. There's the dusky and the sooty. And uh, they have a different um, call. One of them tends to strut um, and display on the ground. One of them tends to strut and display in a tree. They make a different noise. The eye comb's different, totally different habits, right? Not a lot of bleed over between the two. So we have decided that based on these criteria, um, there's actually a sooty grouse on the coast and a dusky grouse in the interior, and we're splitting them. I was like, that, that's great. That's great. One of that case, it's like you looked across the spectrum of birdiness, you decided this is the case. There's another bird. There's a bird called an old squaw, a uh, duck called an old squaw. Uh, someone at a point, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of movement over the years. I don't know how many squaw peaks became something different. People used to call salmon candy, uh, squaw candy. It's like 
there's just this general movement away from a term, even though the term was used by native peoples, there's a movement away from a term that has been deemed to be derogatory. So the old squaw became the long tailed duck. The squaw fish became the Northern pike minnow. And I'm like, okay, okay, I get it. To, to, to go in and, and, and do this under the, under the pretext of what they're saying, they're saying that it's exclusionary, meaning that, well, first off, you have to ask yourself, just take a step back from it. What is a birder? It's like, it, it's very hard to define a birder because we don't have the same term for a person. We don't have the same term for fish. We don't have the same term for mammals. So a birder, I would gather, means you are an individual who's interested in birds. And if you're interested in fish, like if I see a fish that I don't know what it is, I'm damn sure interested in finding out what the fish is. But there's no word for that. You're just a per- whatever the hell. You're just a person. If I see a mammal um, and I'm in a new area and I'm like, what in the hell was that? I want to go find out what it is. But there's no, there's no name for that. So, so birding has sort of created that there's a thing called birding and it's being interested in birds, I gather. They're proposing here that an individual who's not previously interested in birds, I mean, they, they, they've been inspired by life to become interested in birds. They decide that they want to become interested in birds. So like, you know what? I'm going to become more interested in birds. And they see a bird um, fly by and they're like, what in the hell was that bird? This is the, this is the reasoning that the ornithological society thinks that people are going through. I'm an individual um, and I see a bird go by. I'm like, wow, look at that crazy purple iridescent loud ass bird go by. I'm like, I'm going to find out what that bird was. So I start looking through my bird book and I'm go like, Oh shit. It's a Stellar's J. What they're saying here is that individual goes, Hmm, who's this Stellar feller? 90% of white birders don't know who Stellar was, but they're saying an individual is going to be like, oh, a Stellar's J. Hmm, I wonder what the etymology of that is. And then they're going to look and be like, oh, here he is. He's this guy, and he went to the Arctic and has a name to sea lion and a, and a this and that after himself. Oh, ha, he's a white male. Fuck that bird. I'm getting out of birding. I just like, there's no yeah. way that's happening. Yeah, That's a partial argument. Is your, is your connection to birding so tenuous? I don't think that's the that main you would the main quit because you found out it was a white guy. The main thrust, it's, I think, is, is, like, is, is immortalizing someone in, like, in, in, in some way that maybe... I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna throw my ball in whichever direction this is going. But it's immortalizing someone who maybe shouldn't be immortalized in that way. I think it's more That's that than, than like. Saying, no. Well, I'm gonna look at who this guy is. I'm like, no. oh, maybe he has some I good ideas. I think you're oversimplifying like this, Stephen, because it's a fun I, argument for you, no, which it, is a theme we've experienced in the past. Okay, go on. Um, a, Seventy bird species. A yeah, sure. Make it seven hundred. Whatever. <laughs> Um, You've run out of birds well, after a while. Part of this, right, is like when we look at the squaw fish to northern pike minnow, mm-hmm. there's a rebranding on behalf of the species, right? To where you had um, an association with this species that could be causing that species harm. And then when with that rebrand, yep. the idea is there's a uh, a larger respect that comes along with the rebrand it gets a facelift, and then they people, put a bounty. They put a bounty on it in its native waters. Well, in some places, right? But that's a huge different. Mm-hmm. We can pick a different deal if you want, right? Uh, but you do understand what I'm saying. 100%. So when we then have an association with something that has like a a, a very well. Uh, everybody has a negative opinion of a certain name that could then have a negative effect on that species, which would be a pro for a rebrand, in my opinion. Right? There's a big difference between well, it's the word... it's not nearly as fun as word... being like, oh, it's anti-white people. No, there's a big difference between the word squaw and the word stellar. Which is not my argument at all. No, yeah, okay. Um, absolutely. They're spelled different. <laughs> Both have S in them. That's good. <laughs> um, but the, the flip side here is for history. Every time you do come across something like this, 
Uh, like we had, you know, great discussions on the renaming of Mount Gore, right? Mm -hmm. And that brings into light that individual's history mm -hmm. again when these conversations come up. And I think that that's incredibly valuable. So valuable that we may not want to change these names because it would be removing this spotlight that circles back around on the past actions of these people. And that's what history is about is going back mm -hmm. and relearning and seeing where we are in time and trying not to make those same mistakes. Um, but some people at the end of the day are just giant assholes. And I say they shouldn't be associated with anything. That's not the criteria here. I think, again, the criteria here you're is, focusing is, is on a very one shot, aspect of a very it. shotgun approach. It's a very shotgun approach. They could have, uh, I don't know, there could be a Abe Lincoln bird and it's, they're going to throw out the Abe Lincoln bird. It's a it's hard named after line a person. to draw, right? It's a ridiculous line to draw. It's distracting. It's like, you know, uh, P, uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals, they will often do things to generate headlines, Right. Because they, the way that they get coverage, they get coverage oftentimes from an opposing perspective who covers PETA under the, oh my God, what will they do next? Right? So PETA will pick a thing that, that just seems sort of like outlandish because it, gen it puts them in the news cycle. It's like inconsequential, outlandish, and you know, it'll get tons of coverage because the coverage will be, holy smokes, these people are crazy. And they feed that narrative because that's just generally. You can't beat a dead horse. You feed a fed horse or something. They did a, they, um. Yep. Yeah. All, uh, all the. They, the they things, came yeah. out with the thing that we have a lot of sayings. More than one way to skin a cat. And they're like, we need to stop using all these sayings because these sayings are. And, yeah. and they get tons of, you get people talking about it because even if they're talking about it negatively, they're still talking about it and it creates a, a, a conversation. I feel that this move is coming from a PR person. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a person who is generating, who's creating noise for the sake of creating noise. It's like, I find that there's a much bigger problem of people seeing a bird and not knowing what they're looking at and not caring than I do that they do a bunch of diligence and find out it's named after an individual that they're going to wind up not liking. I well, what do they have to ridiculous. gain from making noise? It's not like PETA. What does the ornitho Ornithological Society have to gain from They probably like, like to be in the news. They are probably mm -hmm. very excited. I'm not saying it's like they, they would be excited about conversations like this. What I, like what I don't like about it, man, is, uh, and I didn't read this article at all, um, and from Yanni's perspective, uh, and it's right, I am coming at it from a, you know, Montana, born and raised white kid. Um, but, you're, you're kind of like leaving it up to this society to dictate what they think is right or wrong in history too. Yeah. Right. So like they didn't name the birds in the first place. They're, they're deciding what names, uh, we should be able to like attribute to animal species or not, which in my opinion, like it's very, well, not in my opinion, it gets very political, right. On behalf of whatever their kind of their personal direction is like, what about rivers? What if we started doing the same thing with rivers? Jefferson River goes away. People get right? mad when you do this because you go like, well, what will happen when Washington, D.C. isn't Washington, D.C.? And then go like, well, now you're just doing like trickle down. What's next? Mm -hmm. and, 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 slippery slope. Slippery slope. I don't like to do all that, but you do wonder. Here's what, here, here I don't want to, I want to talk about, I want to talk about riding crazy horses, but well, I mean, I want to talk about this too, but. Finally, there's this, there's this idea that this is the thing I like, I'm honestly curious about. If you get to, if you, the, we have the, uh, the constitution, we have a constitution that protects free, it, it codifies free speech. Okay. So you have this, this document that paves the way for free speech and paves the way for a separation of powers and paves the way for a separation of church and state. And then you go and say, but um, we're going to get rid of any kind of marking of the individuals that did it because they, we've, they're bad people from the beginning. At what point do you also ditch the thing they made? And what do you replace it with? So if you say there can't be a bird named after this guy, that's horrible. There shouldn't be a statue of this guy because that's horrible. There shouldn't be a town of this guy because that's horrible. In fact, 
But what about the fact that we're living under a document that they created? At what point is that horrible? And what is the, what is the alternative guiding national principle? When you ditch all aspects of these people because there's things about them you didn't like, at what point do you go like, and not only that, but all this stuff about like freedom of the press, free speech, um, being, uh, you know, double jeopardy, having your house seized by the military to store soldiers. Like at what point is all that kind of stupid? Because the people that made it were bad people. I, I just think it's like, it's just, it, it's, it's a, I think it's a largely kind of a, it's just like this, like it's an exercise in divisiveness. Um, well, in theory, you can amend that document. You know, it's very difficult to do, but I'm like, you know, it's, it's not like well, yeah, that you, doc- can, you can amend it only by the rules of the document. Yeah, true. That's true. Okay. So uh, that is laid out in the document. Yeah. I'm just, there's, I, a, there's, a, there's only so far you can go with this before you run up against a real wall. Well, if there was a bird called the Rommel's bird. I, we can agree that the distance of how far you can go is a big, big difference. Distance between changing the name of a bird and tearing up the U.S. Constitution. Sure, I know. That is a long way. That is so far of a long way that I would say we will never, ever, ever get there. I think that, you'll, I think that in your lifetime it will be toyed with. I think it's been toyed with since it was written. Be toyed with from a different angle. I don't want to conflate that with this bird thing. I just think the bird thing is like you can't just all of a sudden you can't just all of a sudden do it. It's going to create another thing like this. You know when uh, years ago I was uh, when I, I, I was working on a writing project and I was with some guys from the Buffalo Field Campaign. Okay, this is a whole other angle. This is a whole other annoyance I have with this naming thing. I was with some guys from the Buffalo Field Campaign. So the Buffalo Field Campaign. Is na- you know, what they're, what they're, they're, they were a preservation organization. The world got a little bit too complicated for them, but at a time it wasn't too complicated for them, and they were a fairly active preservation organization for the American bison, but they called it the old-timey word buffalo, which was around hundreds of years before anybody ever thought to say the American bison. So I'm with a guy from the Buffalo Field Campaign, and I see off in the distance a bunch of pronghorn. And I said, oh, there's some antelope. And he said, it's actually a pronghorn. I'm like, well, it's actually not the buffalo. And so to have to go through that now, 70 or 80 times more than you have to go through it now, and all the conversations you have with some old ass duck hunter who went out and shot an old squan, you got to be like, oh, you know, actually it's a, you know, it's a long tailed duck. I mean, I don't know if you caught the caught word, I just think it's ridiculous. It's a distraction. Yeah, and, but man, we may never, ever, ever be faced with that distraction. Hmm? Uh, of the 70 species, mm-hmm. how many do you interact with frequently? Quite a few. The Stellar's Jay, I count among my favorite birds. And the English Sparrow, what, what happens to his ass? Um, yeah, I count among the, the Stellar's Jay among my favorite birds. Uh, moving on. Here's an interesting letter. There's a guy. So a guy wrote in. He was, um, him and his buddies are all special operations veterans. And they lately have gotten into going into landlocked, hunting landlocked private land. And they've done it with aircraft. Public land. Sorry. What did I say? Landlocked public land. Sorry. They have, they have become, they, they have become enthusiasts of hunting landlocked public land, meaning public land you can't access by walking or driving because it's surrounded by private land. And they were using, um, they would pitch together money and, and just get a helicopter to land them in these certain areas they wanted to hunt. But they found that like landing the helicopter is very intrusive, noisy, um, can draw a lot of attention. And they all hold, uh, and they're all former military guys. So they've, <laughs> They've been um, bailing out of helicopters at seven to 10,000 feet and parachuting into land where they want to hunt. And then they just get picked up later by the helicopter. So they land parachuting. And in classic special operator fashion, their eyes are all blacked out in the pictures. But he's got, um, here he, par- he parachuted in and he's got a grip and grin with his antelope. 
that he killed uh, with his parachute in the background. Oh, actually, I'm. Well, there's a his, will. There's a way. That's I'm commitment. reading his email. It does says landlocked private land, but I think he meant to say yeah, public yeah, land because that wouldn't make any sense. No. Yeah, I mean, I. Well, there's a will. There's a way. It's I think that does take commitment. Play. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. But man, like we've talked about this, like on the technical gear side, like how we, you know, we, what we do all year round is talk about how we go and kill critters. Like we game it all year. Mm. Can you imagine being an antelope in this picture and you look up and you see some sky, like some guys jumping out of a helicopter coming in and be like, when does it end? Yeah. Like, golly, yeah. man. What's next? I mean, it's cool though. <laughs> I don't want to get into the birth control thing on deer because that's been talked about a lot. Also from a high level, I think that it's interesting. So, uh, urban, suburban environments where you have a lot of, uh, like too many deer, overabundance of deer, uh, from the standpoint of property damage, vehicular collisions, um, all these different issues. Uh, these guys have been having some luck with contraceptives um, in Canada. And they bring up an interesting point in the article I hadn't thought of. When you do a culling operation, if it's good habitat and you do a culling operation, what do you, what do you imagine happens after you kill them all? Like, other ones just move in. But just saying through this through this experimentation work they're doing with contraceptives is you keep the landscape occupied, but they just can't reproduce. And it's less inviting to new animals coming in because you have these like dominant breeding age animals around. Um what what's their plan for administering the contraceptives? They in dart this them. one. Right. Yeah. And that's what I've heard about I is mean, like how, who darted what and it, it's complicated. I, you know, I, I always look and I'm always like, yeah, but there's probably people who'd pay money to go hunt those deer. And it, it is in this article, they're like in, in Oak Bay, you cannot have people running around hunting. It just isn't going to, it's not workable. So that's, that's the thing. A guy wrote in a very spirited rebuttal of our conversation around Catalina Island muleys. He's a biologist who's been working out on the cat. Oh, let me first, let me first give a quick thing. So on Catalina Island, um, they have, uh, there's a herd of Buffalo out there, which are brought out there for some movie. In the, like in the early days of cinema, I can't remember when they brought the, the, there's a herd of Buffalo out there and there's a bunch of mule deer out there. And, um, I talked about, well, why not just have people go hunt them? Um, who wouldn't want to go hunt these mule deer and why, why sharp shoot them with helicopters when you could just, you know, lower their populations with hunters. He writes in a couple of thoughts on why that's not, uh, why that doesn't work quite the way you'd think it did. So he's been out. Um, he's been working on the California channel islands for 25 years. He's a biologist. He thought he'd add a few things around the deer cult issue. Santa Catalina, I'm quoting him. Santa Catalina Island is completely private property either owned by the Santa Catalina Island Company. Um, 11% is owned by the Wrigley family, chewing gum. Uh, so owned by the Santa Catalina Island Company, the Catalina Island Conservancy, or people who own houses in Avalon. Um, there's no public land whatsoever. So I know that was pretty confusing, but the Conservancy has 88% of the land. Uh, 1% of the land is just Joe Blow people who own houses in the town. 11% of the land is the Wrigley family. Okay. It's entirely private land. He says they got about 2000 mule deer on the Island. Now they've been giving out 400 tags per year. Every year, 240 of those tags are filled. Check this out. There are 4,000 residents on the Island. 20 of them get a deer. So they're killing 400 tags. They're killing 240 mule deer a year. And as in terms of why not just let the locals shoot them of the 4,000 locals, 240. Um, I'm sorry of the 4,000 locals, 20 get a deer. He says that DIY hunting out there doesn't really work. One, you can't rent a car. Um, it's hard to even get out of town if you're not a resident because you're on the private property. Steep roads, long distances. 
there's no way to get, there's no refrigeration facilities to keep meat cold, and there's no way to, there's no easy way to quickly get it back onto the mainland because you're using the ferry system to transport them. He says, thus, for these reasons, guided hunts are the rule. There's no, there's no path forward. In, his, in this guy's opinion, there's no like realistic path forward for DIY mule deer hunts out there. Mule deer were brought to the island less than 100 years ago. Private landowners brought them there and put them on private land to hunt them. They were brought from California mainland, and that is why the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has jurisdiction. All the land is privately owned, and the private landowners who own all the land, so again, here we are, these guys own 88% of the ground, and they want the deer off their land. But they're holding California Department of Fish and Game responsible for their deer. And the conservancy is paying to eradicate the deer. There is no state or federal money involved. The deer also do not belong to the people of Avalon, meaning the people who live on the island. Just like a deer eating someone's garden does not belong to someone driving by on the road. And he goes on to say that deer have documented negative impacts on native plants and animals which are only found, so endemics, only found on the California Channel Islands. The islands are the, quote, Galapagos of North America, specifically because they have those unique plants and animals. Um, He says they also use this term to market tourism. He says there are a lot of mule deer on the mainland. If the deer and other non-native animals and plants are not controlled on and preferably moved, removed from the islands, eventually the islands will look just like the mainland, the island's distinctiveness will be lost. Then he has a couple sum ups. Um, basically, him saying we got that all wrong. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, private deer, right, is what it amounts to. Trail cam Chattakit. This is a phenomenal one, even though Chester's not here. The reason I say this is phenomenal because I recently heard someone say this. This guy hunts public land in Texas. Often comes across trail cameras. Okay. So again, he's on public land and he comes across a trail camera. Um, I often come across, he, this is a quote. I often come across trail cameras, which on most public land spots are not supposed to be left for more than 24 hours or beyond your hunt. He carries his own SD card read, his SD card reader in his pack. He likes to pull the camera, since it's sitting there anyway. He likes to pull the camera and have a look-see. The card. Sorry, he likes to pull the card and have a look-see. Puts everything back the way he founds it. Is this poor etiquette? If it's on public land, I say everybody's got a right to look. I would say the same. It Mm -hmm. seems weird, but like after kicking it around, I would say, like, like for instance, if you put a pop-up blind somewhere that's not your yeah you know, it doesn't claim your area you put a tree stand in a tree that doesn't claim your tree um we we're hunting public in oklahoma and there's a tree that you look and be like any person on the planet's gonna put a tree stand in that tree and you go there and there's all kinds of hooks and nails and shit you <laughs> tell them over the years everybody their brothers hunted this one tree over a water hole um so put a tree stand there it doesn't claim it uh it's, it's, so it's like you forfeit uh, your ownership of the material you paid for once you put it on public land i see both sides yeah it would be hard to go by with with an sd reader and not check it oh well. i think so you, so you you agree mm-hmm. i think it feels like here's the here's the thing is like half the cameras i set out i don't turn them on right you had one out for a whole year. <laughs> oh, I put one out for a whole year, and all year, all I talked about. It, my wife's like, "Oh my god, if you stop talking about stupid camera, all the stuff you're gonna have on that camera, you know, after a whole year out there." And I go up there, I was like, "Da, forgot to turn it on." <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try again this year. Uh, so there's that. It's like, I mean, you know, if they put it all back the way they found it and tidy everything up and turn it back on, I would feel it's one of those things that um. It's one of those things that I get it, but I don't think I would personally do it. Because I would feel so weird having my hand caught in the cookie jar. Because you're on the camera. 
Well, yeah. You don't have that. to be on the camera. No, I know, you can, but like, you can sneak around. If back you stumble and do across it. one, like the odds are you're on there. You've already been yeah, yeah, on that camera. There's like, like a what? There's like how many degree radius of it's your big, passing right? by? I've I've waved at a lot of trail cams in oh, my yeah. day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The the best like video would be you seeing it, going and checking the card. And then setting up a blind right in front of it to what you saw in the card. Yeah. <laughs> because the card was so good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna hunt right, right here. here. <laughs> or you could pretend to be a deer and like go down there and, and put your little lips up to the water. Do a little splashing. Yeah. Thinking. That'd be fun. Yeah, I don't have um um Oh, he has one of those sign off things. You know like when you're on a forum, all the old men have a sign off. Mm-hmm. They're like, um, 44 mag because shooting yeah more than once is stupid or you know, yeah uh, you I, know, kept, like, <laughs> I kept that in there for you because i knew you'd pay attention to it it like colors his character right his his sign off is for god gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control <laughs> Self control. <laughs> Self control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's powerful and not afraid. Uh, yep. Yeah. So uh, this one, uh, even though Chetik is not here, we usually like to give like when we do these, we'll sometimes remember to do a little quick, uh, a quick survey, uh, a quick panel. Yeah, I forgot um, to ask Chester. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's bad, but I wouldn't do it. Zeke. <laughs> I mean, I probably wouldn't check it just because I probably wouldn't have a card reader with me. <laughs> <laughs> but if I had the card reader, I mean, I might. Okay. But if you started hunting public land a bunch, and you knew if I hunted public land a bunch out I, there, I mean, I don't know. That that's a tricky one. I'd probably have my own camera out there. Okay. Check it. Yeah, I'm on, I'm the same way. I don't think I would have a card reader. Um, you well, know. No, okay. Okay. Let me back up. You do. Okay, I do. <laughs> Um, but let's not have. Well, you know, I don't. What if, my, what if my fingers are so cold that I don't have the dexterity? Yeah. <laughs> there's there's so <laughs> many factors to this. Like, had I been in the mountains for say nine days looking and hadn't seen anything, and I had like found this area, and I'm like, the the, the bucks are here. They got to be here. And I stumbled across a trail camera. Oh yeah. Golly, it'd be hard not to look. But I have often fantasized about finding a trail camera, and then shooting a big animal like right in front of it. So they on had footage camera. of it. Like, I got idea. it. I beat you here. You're yeah. at work. I'm not. Guess what? I win. You can make yeah. a little note and say, like, yeah. please send me the photos. Mm. Right. <laughs> can I have the photos <laughs> yeah. of my bug? All, yeah. all your group, yeah. all hey, your big grins are in front of yeah. 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 <laughs> You're welcome to come to my house for a beer and, like, look at it on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that a lot. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've never done the mental gymnastics on this question, but. If I were in an area with a high trail cam density, I'd pack a card reader with me yeah. and it's public land i mean that's yeah mm-hmm. It'd be like if you want to leave it out here yeah then, to your point yeah. it's on public right yeah but you feel obligated to put it back the way you found it yeah for sure oh yeah for sure i want yeah i'd you know you got to like let people know because a trail cam is a i've told many people I'm like hey do not put a trail cam there if you think that is an awesome spot because mm. then it's an indicator to other people that somebody's paying attention to that spot for a reason. Or let's say they think it through even more. And like, he's got a trail camera here, but he's not here. It must not be any good. Mm. Mm. Cause he would know. Huh? Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't put trail cameras <laughs> in bad spots though. Yeah. I, 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 have. I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we put a uh, buddy of mine, killed the bull archery season and Bob tons of grizzlies around put a trail cam on the, on the carcass mm. just to get grizzly photos and swung by the carcass, saw a sow and two cubs on the carcass from a respectable distance. And we were- With your own two eyes. Yeah. Salivating over how cool these photos were going to be. Um, because of the grizzly activity, we couldn't pick it up the same week we were hunting. So um, had to leave it for safety reasons. Came back uh, a couple months later and got the camera and the only thing you see is this cow elk come in mess with it messes with the camera <laughs> rotates the camera around <laughs> <laughs> and we we got nothing we got just that nose in there it was, yeah, it was such a bummer i was like we're gonna there's gonna we're gonna have these pictures on outdoor life you know <laughs> a long time ago it was funny 
Dream. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mess with it. I like mystery. Hmm. Yeah. Taking totally different angle, Garrett. I'm in it for the meat, man. I check that camera all day. Mm-hmm. I'm well, out there to kill stuff. I would just like check I'll, it now and then, probably. Well, it's like yeah, I, would, I wouldn't check it all day, yeah. I guess, but I would definitely. Yeah, it's a public land. Like, don't mess. I'd rather somebody check it than screw with my camera. Like, I've had cameras taken before. Yeah, or steal your camera. Yeah. I'm right along with Garrett, a buddy of mine who's uh, hunts not far from our place in Wisconsin on public land a lot as well. Um, he was just telling me that he did a, this exact thing. And he thinks that the advent of these cellular cameras now that have GPS uh, systems within them, mm-hmm. so you can actually track your camera. And it's meant to be used as like, oh, I, I, I set it and I forgot it where I put it. Now or someone I, horks it. Well, yeah, but so now people are realizing that they have these systems in them, so he feels like there's a lot less stealing of these GPS-enabled cell mm. cameras going on out there, which is a nice thing. Which, again, in his mind, he was like, yeah, I'd much rather someone just checks my card versus takes my $300 camera. You know, my, uh, this is not apropos of that conversation, but my, I have two trail cam pictures I've gotten that I'm proud of. I have, I showed you the otter carrying the trout, which mm-hmm. I like a lot. Mm-hmm. And then I have a bear on New Year's Eve wading through the snow. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. These are not trail oh, to his cam belly picks. in the snow. Oh, it was wow. that same. It was the same camera that you left on. You didn't have on all year. No, but buy that one. Oh, was buy it. Okay. Yeah. I gotta tell you a story about a dead deer picture that I saw. Grip and grim. I didn't believe it at first, but then I got the pictures, and I I, I left my phone upstairs so I didn't have the issues of uh, you know messing with our uh, mics in here. But I'll, I'll show you later. But just listen up here. This dude shoots a buck. From a distance, he can see there's something around its neck. Like the buck's obviously been entangled in some in something. Mm-hmm. Turns out that it's like that electrical wire that you'd use to, or like tape that you run around um, to, to like electrify yeah. a fence. You know yeah, what like, I mean? It's like a wired tape. Yeah. So it's pretty tough stuff. Within that tape around his neck are the deer's antlers from the previous year no way holy <laughs> smokes <laughs> they're not it's not a giant buck but like he he's ba- got his sheds he's got his up sheds there. yeah so it's hard to say whether like <laughs> the old twofer if he got it st- like stuck in the antlers first and then it sort of worked its way onto its neck you know later oh, sure yeah, as it all just, came down that's phenomenal because you know when you show someone a uh, pair of sheds and you're like well how do you know that was from yeah. that buck <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to shoulder mount that deer exactly as you shot yeah. it oh that's, that's the first thing like 100 percent. that's great uh one last little thing this is this is a this is a i'm bringing this one up because it's it's a it's a great it's a it's a uh at a loss for words brings up a lot of complexities so the Wolverine um, in the lower 48 is uh, Endangered Species Act protections are imminent. This is an interesting one because you're operating on the, the animals so poorly understood that you're, you're, you're sort of admitting that you're operating on a bit of assumption that here you have this animal that lives at extremely low densities, even in the best of times. No one has ever had an adequate way to count them. So you can't demonstrate an actual decline, but you have to look at the writing on the wall and be like, this ain't good. Meaning there are so few Wolverines and none of the things that are happening meaning development, loss of habitat, uh, warming environments. Like none of the things that are happening are going to do these things any good. And it's guesswork how many there were. It's guesswork how many there are. But people are looking and being like, man, it's got to be bad. And so you have an animal not whose population dynamics and ecology is not at all well understood moving to ESA protection. The one, one thing about this, this is, uh, I'm always telling people to read Osborne Russell's Journal of a Trapper. It was really, in the end of Osborne Russell's Journal of a Trapper, he has these little synopses of animals, just kind of observations about animals. And it's so funny because that dude calls wolverines abundant hmm. or common, common hmm. animal. 
And you're like, what in the hell? Mo-? Like, you know what I mean? Was it, was it a typo? Did, you know, uh, who, what did he mean? But he says common, a common animal, hmm. Wolverine. Or was he just from, from the, from the he... 1800s? Or was he like, I'm such a badass, <laughs> yeah. common to me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, years and years ago, I was guiding out a glacier and had a uh, Wolverine climb down a cliff in front of us, swim the river, <laughs> got it on, on video at the time. I was mm-hmm. packing, packing a camera with me a lot. Uh, climb up the other side of the, the cliff, uh, middle fork of the flathead, real narrow gorge section. And he sits up on top of that cliff and just like cusses us out. Hmm. Like, like unbelievable. Making what noise? Unbelievable. Just kind of like spitting and, and kind of, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. like being a very ornery critter. Uh, I was kind of like, well, you chose to reveal yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, how is it our fault? Type of thing. Yeah. Uh, but very, very cool. And I thought, man, that's once in a lifetime experience. For Probably. Sure. Uh, like, like almost like literally maybe a once in a lifetime experience or? yeah I mean the swimming the whole thing a yeah. lot, of, lot of things it, it is right probably um, that the next June I'm in Alaska working uh, a brown bear hunt on the peninsula and it's a late late winter up there everything snowed in uh, pretty bad bear season but every single day I saw multiple wolverines that for the first week of that trip. Multiple. Multiple wolverines. They were following us around. They were popping over snow banks. They seemed to be just like hmm. your general super inquisitive weasel. No kidding. And, you know, so I was kind of deflated from my previous wolverine experience. So I was like, well, apparently you can just go someplace and see a ton of wolverines every day. Yeah, which is like when Osborne Russell was running around here all those years ago. Was it that? Because if that's the case, then they are hurting. <laughs> or yeah. was it because, like, you can go out on the Alaska Peninsula and not see a wolverine all week. Was it mm. just that late onset winter? We were hiking where uh, the squirrels and stuff were popping up, or maybe there was meat cached underneath those snowbanks from slides or who knows. But was there just a relatively unnatural concentration of wolverines at that time. Yeah. Well, you could have been seeing the same couple of wolverines over and over too, right? Yeah, but real social. Unless they ones. had distinct markings, right? Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. For I sure. was deflated when I learned that you know, I grew up in the Wolverine state and I was deflated when I learned that um it's kind of like eh, maybe. Oh, no way. <laughs> maybe now and then. I was thinking of you. <laughs> but the not thick. They weren't thick. Other know? day I was hiking to get water out of this spring and uh full white uh, ermine weasel was following me around at the spring and I was making little uh, mouse noises and he came into like 20 yards and got to look at him through the 10 by 50s. Mm-hmm. Just super awesome. Already white? Completely white. Was there snow on the ground? Yep. Pink oh, okay. little pads. Hmm. Had his hands Cute. up like this. Do, do they? Uh, I get sense you want to move on, but um, no, no, I'm good. Uh, this is interesting. Do, do they like mention what it? You know, Wolverine being added to the endangered species list. What that means? Well, you can kind of look by. You can look at some other examples because, for instance, um, there's no hunting or trapping for wolverines in the lower 48, mm-hmm. so it's not going to mean the cessation of those kind of activities. But one thing that they'll do is so, for instance, with lynx, they create like these lynx protection zones, yeah. which come with added restrictions on fur trapping to diminish the likelihood that a trapper might accidentally catch a lynx. Um, and then even like even people involved in that are admit that they overdrew the map that at the time they didn't understand mm-hmm. lynx habitat. And so they got a lot of stuff rolled up into trapping prohibitions that never had and never will have links on it. Um, with the Wolverine stuff, because they're they like rock and ice, you know, high country critters. Right. I don't know. I could picture that it might have implications for uh, logging projects, maybe have implications mm-hmm. for road building, might have inc- implications for mining, but I don't picture it bleeding over into hunting activities. Yeah, I mean, well, just to make this about me. Mm-hmm. Um, Go ahead. Like where I get nervous about this kind of stuff is one of the best snowmobile places like 
around this area. I would look for this to change. Was uh <laughs> was up highlight, right? Like so, you yeah. used to go up there and it was just like endless powder, amazing riding. And I remember I was I was pretty young when it happened, but I remember one year my dad was like, Well, we can't go there anymore because it got listed as a wilderness study area mm -hmm. for Wolverine. Mm. But it, it wasn't wilderness. It was just like they're like well, we want to study if there There's is a lot of wilderness study areas. Yeah. Yeah. But they're, it was just like, limbo. they sit in limbo. It was just like overnight, all of a sudden they were like, oh, there could be wolverines here and we want to study it, which means, and then, you know, I don't want to get too political, but then it just like all of a sudden they like, they paved like this massive trail from one of the trailheads all the way up to the lake mm -hmm. for cross country skiers, which was like ironic to, to us, yeah. right? In terms of, so just whenever I read this, just selfishly, I'm like, what, what does that mean? For playing up there. I could picture that um, there are certain high country snowmobile areas that could, I mean, I'm, I'm totally yeah. guessing. I have no idea. I could picture that that would be potentially a thing mm -hmm. when trying to think about what might be a thing. And you know your observation, I don't want to get political. I think that everything is political. Yeah. When people say I don't want to get political, it's like everything is political. Yeah. I don't want to get political but I couldn't put my septic system where I wanted it. <laughs> That's politics. Yeah. You know, it's like, everything's political. Everything's political. Uh, all right. Zeke Thurston. We covered when, uh, when, when, a, when a bronc rider becomes the old man, but we didn't cover how, how why as a young man did you get into bronc riding? How? Well, can, you, can you hit some basic definitions too, just to help people understand? Like what? Like, like what that, like you, know, you got the different, event different rodeo events yeah so, what your event is and what sort of you know what distinguishes the event you like to do yeah so rodeo is made up of well you got like six major events um and team roping is uh i guess it's probably an event, a major event now too but um uh at the rough stock side of the arena that's that's where uh you know we we perform or whatever and You've define got, that too define so rough stock. the rough stock would be your riding events of like uh, you got your bareback riding saddle bronc riding and bull riding and then uh, rough stock meaning like not broken. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then uh for the timed event side, they've you've got rope and boxes or boxes and and a chute, and that's where they team rope, calf rope, bulldog, and uh and then the barrel racing is just run in the middle of the arena. Mm -hmm. Obviously. So for for my event, um you you get on a horse, uh you have a what you call bronc rein or a hack rein, and that's what you hold you hold on to. It's connected to a halter that goes on the horse's head. Mm -hmm. um, we have a saddle. You have uh, free swinging stirrups, um, so a foot in each side, and uh, you got to keep your free arm up, and uh, you have to ride for eight seconds. Um, it's a judged event, um, so there'll be judges on the arena floor. Uh, they judge the horse and the rider. Um, the uh, like stipulations, I guess, is like you would... You have to spur your horse out, so that, that means you have to have spur contact above the horse's shoulder the first jump out of the chute when his front feet hit the ground. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, you try to pick up the horse's timing, and you want to spur um, as high as you can, set your feet in the neck um, in time with the horse while he bucks. So the spur ride is judged off of um, speed, spur contact, um, how high you spur. A little is the spurring actually causing the bucking? No, no. The, the animals are... The animals are bred to buck. Like they're, that's, that's the way they are. But the animals judged because you don't get more points if the horse is having a bad day. No, no, you get, you get less points. Right. Um, oh, so that, I always wondered about that. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that well enough. Yeah. Cause then there so, I was like, what if the so horse that, is just like a, like just comes out and stands there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously you, you don't count, but you that, get a re-ride. Yeah. But um, obviously, so, so it hit, so. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't need to re-articulate it, but I've always wondered no, no, about so that, like how they calibrate that. Yeah, so the judging criteria is from one to fifty. The horse is judged off of how high he jumps in the air, how high, like how high his back end, you know, when he kicks, how high he's kicking, and, and these how are, these hard are like he's kicking. measured. These are measured things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, and then obviously like other factors come into like play, like speed, um, direction change. Um, I mean, they, they like to see direction changes. Yeah, like because that that makes the difficulty level go up, right? Yep. So like your horse is, you know, lands with his front feet over here, and then the next jump he, you know, lands over here four feet. Yep, yep. Um, that's obviously a lot lot harder to ride than one that's going straight chalk line straight. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so one to fifty for the for the bucking horse, and then one to fifty for the the bronc rider. So a total of a hundred points possible. Got it. How do you yeah. get a like a signed a horse? 
So it's a random draw. The judges at the rodeo will, um, actually they do it in the PRCA office three days prior to the rodeo. Um, the stock contractor, whoever is um, supplying stock or putting putting on the rodeo will um, send in their list of horses. So you got, you know, you got your uh, pool of bareback horses for the bareback riding, and then you have your saddle bronc horses and then their bulls. And the judges will go through there and draw just random draw an animal for each contestant that's entered in that rodeo. Is that a spectator event too? Like, like, do real insiders like to go watch the draw? Like the way people pay oh, attention the draw? to draft. No, no. The way people pay attention to draft picks. And no, stuff like I, that? no, nobody's in on the draw. Just, just, uh, it just happens. Yeah, and they happens. say, "Here's what happened." Yeah, you find out three days before what horse you have, and you, you decide if you're going to go get on it or not, and do your deal. I got a question for Giannis. Guess what? An old. You know how I asked him how old a guy can be and still mm-hmm. compete? Um, guess what an old horse is? An old bronc, old bucking horse. How long his a career can be. Bucking horse. Yeah. 15. 15. No, that's, they're just getting started at 15. They had, he was telling me about a horse that was still kicking off pro riders at 24 years of age. He said they get better. Oh. Cause they actually I mean, that's, learned... an old, that's an old bucking horse for sure. But like their, their career, their best years <laughs> are career. from. Is he aware that he has a career? I wonder. Well, they, He's I like, mean, oh, the horse is like, what are you going to do when this is all over, man? <laughs> He's reached like doctor status. The, uh, that horse I was telling you about, those 24. They, yeah, what was his name? Uh, Sundance. They retired him. Um, that year he was retired. They didn't load him on the truck to go to the national finals rodeo. The next day they found him out behind the shed and he had passed away. Oh. I bet if Pass, they, I like a bet, euphemism or he had passed no, away. No, he passed away. But I bet if they loaded him on the truck, he probably would have still been ticking. Died of a broken heart. I think so. Oh. I honestly think so. He wanted to go to the big show. Yeah. They love it that much. They do. Um really. Oh. But like their best years are from ten to ten to eighteen. Probably. See, man, me being a dumbass about this, I would have thought for some reason that you find yourself like a three, four year old horse that no one's ever been near. And he's going to give the best ride he'll ever give the first time someone jumps on. That's Steve, because you should that's test what, that theory. That's, that's because that's what we usually get bucked off of is oh, three-year-old horses. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's when they start them. Yeah. But that's no different than Brady, you know, training a puppy. It's going to run out there and and mess up. You know, like there's mm-hmm. lots of so that's what we call colts. And there's they're they're you know they they've got it bred into them. They're really trying to buck, but there's. They're trying to do too much, you know. They they don't have a pattern. They don't know what they're doing. So there's, there's, you know, they're they can do anything. So do you think they legit? I mean, you're saying this essentially, but they legit learn. Like, here's how I like to get people off me, and I find that this works. Oh, for or I sure. find that that works. Oh, absolutely. They're smart. Like they uh, they can feel like which which way you're, you know, what side you have more weight in, and they might turn and go away from that leg. Um, no kidding. Oh yeah, they 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 are, they get really tricky. Some of them get like uh, they kind of like play little mind games. Like when you're, you're crawling down on them in the buck and shoot, they'll kind of like squat and like kind of stand shitty in the buck and shoot. And then <laughs> like and some of them you can't get to stand good. So you can't get a good. No, you can't then, get your position. But yeah, and so when you nod, then then they dart out of there and. And he's know, already got you thrown they, off. They might. So can you watch uh, watch some film on these horses? I was asking and, and if he get scouts. Some tells? If he yeah. scouts. Yeah. And be like, oh, this is kind of this, this yeah, guy's like, style. Like, so like when you get to the point where I'm at and you're going you know, and you're doing it for a living, like um, a lot of the, the horses that we compete on end up at the same rodeos as us. You know, at the biggest rodeos, they, they try to have the best stock um, for the contestants. So, so we see them. You see each other in the cafeteria line. We see them. We yeah. see them over and over and over. Um, like Calgary Stampede stock contracting firm from Alberta. Like we'll see those horses from January um, till the end of September at the end of the season. What right now is what? What's a horse you guys talk about? Like you and your peers? Oh uh, well, probably like the most recently crowned bucking horse of the world is Explosive Skies, owned by Calgary Stampede. It's almost like they knew he was going to be good. Yeah, she's good. <laughs> she. She. Is it usually a she? Uh, no, they can be they, geldings, mares, or studs. So that, oh, that's that's, that's not, not an issue. They're no, not, so they're like not, the, they don't always wind up being one or the other. Uh, no, no. And yeah. so like the theory of like the flank strap goes around the testicles is thrown out the window because half of them are, are mares. Man, that really surprises me. Is, is there not a lot of... Uh... Is there not a lot of sexual dimorphism in, in horses? Meaning 
um, the males aren't always a little heavier or something like that? Like, so if you leave a horse a stud, like they'll get like pretty distinct features, like where their, like their jaw or their jowl, like right here will get, really get, um, like it gets, gets swollen almost and, and quite a bit more prominent than say, like if you geld a horse at two years old, mm -hmm. um, they get real hard necks. They usually grow quite a bit of mane. Um, they're kind of a little more like, they're just, they're just a harder, leaner animal. You can tell when you look at them. Yeah. 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 Um, but that a lot, doesn't a lot, necessarily. A lot of testosterone running through them. Yeah. But yeah. they, but they might turn around and in a, in a mare can outbuck them. Oh yeah, for sure. Studs are actually kind of finicky. Like, um, there's been some really good studs, uh, but for the most part, a lot of, a lot of contractors just use their studs at home for breeding, um, because they can, they can be kind of inconsistent, um, just, just because they can get running so hot and, and, uh, yeah, like, like studs, studs don't seem to last as long as, as a gelding or a mare. Would like a hot mare kind of throw their game off to you or something yeah, like that? Yeah, for sure. Like definitely the hormones do play a part. Like if a, if a mare is like in heat or something, like she might have an off day and mm -hmm. not be as good as, as she normally would be. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, that all plays a role. That's what, like geldings, you know, they, they just have one job eat in the back pen and go out there and buck. When you're they're matched usually up. Pretty, they're usually pretty consistent. When mm -hmm. you're matched up at three days prior, you said people then get to decide if they're actually going to go out and ride that animal. Mm -hmm. um, what is the decision-making process? Obviously, it's like, could you, like, if you have enough points, right, uh, do you go, oh, this horse is having a really hot streak right now, so I'm not going to ride? Yeah, like like for the most part, we I mean you you don't enter the rodeo to not go right right. So you you plan on going, um, and competing, but I mean there's we you don't turn out a lot, but like the times that you would turn out is like maybe if you draw a horse that's kind of inferior to like where you know you have no chance of winning. Um, the other time is maybe like if you have a horse that's that's maybe known for for doing something you know that where it could hurt you. Oh, mm. so you're saying that. You draw a horse that's not as good, so no matter how well you ride, that horse isn't going to get yeah. judged high enough to then give you enough points to do anything beneficial for Correct. you. Correct, yeah. So, like, say, like, your average bucking horse would be a 20-point horse. So, if I get on that horse and I do my job correctly, I put a 23-point spur ride on that horse, you know, you double that up, I'm 86 points. If you draw a horse that's, you know, commonly a 17 point horse, it doesn't matter how, how good you ride, you, you know, max, max, you can be 80 points and probably not going to win anything. Gotcha. Zeke knows I'm good enough that like before a rodeo, he'll tell me if he's probably going to make the short go or not. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. Before you even get on? Yeah. Like you have a pretty good idea of, of how it's going to go before, beforehand, but I mean, they're animals too. So, I mean, they're unpredictable. You can draw a horse that's, you know, normally... You know, maybe not that desirable, and and you wouldn't want to draw it, and you go get on it, and it has the best day of its life, and and you can win the rodeo. Got it. So hundred points is max. Yeah. When when you when you win the world, what kind of points are you getting? Well, that's a so like when you win the world, it's it's based off of your whole season. Um, so a hundred rodeos on your rodeo count, and then you have ten ten rounds at the NFR, and so the the Basically, the world champion is the guy with the most dollars won at the end of it. So what winds up being an app, like if you could put it, like what what is a winning streak of scores, I guess is what I'm asking, you know? Like you got to be in the, if it's 100 top, you got to be in the mid-80s, you got to be in the mid-90s. What's winning go rounds? Okay, yeah. 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 At the NFR to win go rounds, I mean, shoot, nowadays, you probably got to be like 88 points to win most go rounds. Um, but like an 80. An eighty-five is going to place you somewhere most most nights. Yeah. And how much do you feel the judging is is arbitrary and and, and and debatable? And how much of it's just like it's just facts? The facts are facts. I Man, it's however you want to look at it. Um, I mean, it is it is a judged event, you know, and and uh, they they're not always going to get the calls right, you know. It, a lot of it happens fast, and it's with the naked eye. So, I mean, but for the most part, it's it's pretty good. Um, you'll, you'll run into it more like regular season rodeos, maybe where it's, you know, it's not a big rodeo and you'll be like in somebody's kind of, you know, somebody's territory 
and you're you're riding against them kind of you know maybe not their hometown but like their state you know mm-hmm. and, and they're really that they're a big deal in that state they they might not have to outride you to beat you oh you know a little I mean? bit of home <laughs> yeah there's yeah. like a bit like a that, bias that, hap- that happens whether they realize it or not there's a bias yeah. for the local guy for yeah sure. i don't i don't want to make you uncomfortable but like i've thought that i wondered that about the rights until i was uh in pendleton watching you and i was sitting behind somebody else they didn't know me and uh you rode and i thought you got underscored but the person in front <laughs> of me you, yeah the person <laughs> in front of me goes of course because he's zeke thurston and i was like oh well, of course thinking, he got what? underscored or he, of course he got they, a good score? They were score. thinking he got a good got score oh. because he's like <laughs> the reigning <laughs> champ. He, he didn't throw yeah. that out there. And, and I was like, I'm not going to say it hasn't happened to me, but it didn't happen there. I promise you that. <laughs> no, there, there didn't happen. But yeah. Well, what, how old were you when you first got on a horse? Well, my first bronc. Uh, no, I mean like just riding. Like just, oh, like I grew two up riding. Or yeah, yeah, like. Uh, He's actually never ridden a horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I don't just even, eight seconds. Yeah. I don't even have a memory of getting on a horse. Um, just, yeah, I, I just grew up riding. And would your dad put you on ones just to see you get thrown off? Or how, like, how, how do you get started and all that? To get you know? started? No, no. Like, it's, you kind of, there's like stepping stones you go through, you mm-hmm. know, and stuff. But like, I grew up riding a saddle horse, grew up on a ranch in Alberta. So, uh, like, a lot of our days were spent in the saddle, um, just cowboying and doing doing ranch work. And, um, and so you then, guys would work cattle off horseback. Mm-hmm, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. So then like from there, you know, I obviously I rode sheep when I was little and, and did that stuff. And then, um, kind of when in Canada they have at their, at the pro rodeos, they have what they call boys steer riding and you can start that, um, I think like maybe 11. And so I started riding steers. That's how I knocked my teeth out. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, just kind of progress from there to you get on some junior bulls, you know, like two, three-year-old bulls and stuff, um, all like age appropriate and, um, you I mean, know, to, type to, animals. To a point. I mean, depends who you ask. Well, for sure. Like and, your I mean, grandma you know, was like, like, he only <laughs> lost 13 teeth. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, age appropriate. Uh, then you get your teeth kicked out. Did it? Were, did you get a little gun shy after your teeth got knocked out? Yeah, well, I was pretty young, and did then you take I, some time off. Yeah, well, I was eight, and it was at a at a birthday party, and you know, it was more for fun. But uh, that was all I ever wanted to do. And then after that, I was I was kind of maybe second guessing what I wanted to do a little bit. Man, I can't remember if I told this story or not. But you might I should find this article and send it to you. There's a writer, Bricard Bilger. He's a Southern writer. He's the one that he's the one that kind of. Uh, popularized not for the people that do it but popularized for the media noodling for flatheads he had a book noodling for flatheads okay and then it became that that everybody on the planet went, went noodling for flatheads um it was like he kind of like brought this to the public eye right you know there's always been people that do it there. but he like people were like what right i want to go do that that was him he wrote a profile on these uh bull riders he was he was doing all of his work in Nevada, and it was just about this bull riding community in Nevada and little kids learning training to be bull riders. And they start him young, like you're talking about, mm-hmm. like all that he gets into the mutton busting and on up, right? And as he's writing this, so he lives in Park Slope in New York, and simultaneous with him spending all of his time in Nevada with bull rider kids, he's he's also in the same article he's covering the local reception to them putting in rocks in the park down the road from his house in the upheaval and condemnation from parents in park slope, Brooklyn, that they would put actual rocks in the park <laughs> as hard as they are. And that someone needs to get these rocks out of here, and couldn't they have put a rubber we need rock rubber in rocks, here? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. So he's like covering this community issue, and then these twelve cover- year olds are getting on bulls. Cover- he's covering these bull riders in Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> it like it kind of brings the two stories together. And yeah, it is things. So it's like when you talk about like you know within limits it's, or you know it's all pers- age of perspective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think what Zeke is kind of underplaying though is like his dad was an absolute legend, as you like touched on. Mm-hmm. All, and you like grew up touring with your dad a bit too. Yeah. So like I I grew up in it. Like that's that's all I've ever known. Uh, like both sides of my family are just are deeply rooted in rodeo. Uh, my dad, he had a, he had a successful career as a bronc rider. 
Uh, my mom, she did a little announcing, and then they ran the grand entries at, at the Canadian finals, worked for the Calgary Stampede, did the NFR. Um, so always, always been in it and around it. And um, yeah, just that's, that's all I ever remember wanting to do. So I went through the stepping stones and uh, kind of climbed my way up, rode steers, did that whole deal. And what, then, what, are, what are some of the stepping stones? Like just really just being a cowboy kid and and riding riding any animals that you have around the place. But I mean, what are the like the professional ones? Like meaning, um, I can't show up at right. No, I, like I, I can't show up at you know a major event. And be like, hey, I'd like to go too. Right? There's got to be there's a there's a system of yeah. Know, so when you get to like a I did the checks right? Yeah. So like we they through. have high school like junior high rodeos where okay. they have like a build a cowboy program which is, you know, so like you're, you have junior high kids and they put them on, you know, like a bucking machine and judge them on there or they'll get some like Holstein cows and, and, uh, they'll, they'll ride Holstein cows or whatever. And, and you can go through that deal, get to the high school rodeos, you start getting on real Bronx, real bulls. Um, but again, all for the high school level. And, uh, did you ride bulls in high school? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, a roped, a team roped, calf roped, rode bulls, rode Bronx. And then, uh, yeah, once kind of once I went through college and stuff, just kind of narrowed it down to what I really wanted to do, and that was ride Bronx. Yeah, I was asking about that this morning when we were goose hunting. Is uh, you know, if you're uh, you know, there, there's certain disciplines in the Olympics, for instance. There's there's like a you know a, a skier might really excel in um, I don't know what help help me out <laughs> slalom right or whatever yeah. the hell. But then you'll hear that they also competed in some other, mm-hmm. some other like semi-similar. Yeah. yeah. So lay it out for me. Like if you're a skier, you might do blank, blank, and blank. But you have your specialty. Sure. Like all the 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 slalom, the giant slalom, um, and then the super G. Okay. And then the downhill. So. So I was asking him about that, but he's like, not. He was saying nowadays, as though this used to not be the case. Nowadays, you need to. Like competition's so sharp, right? He said nowadays you need to, you have your thing. Yeah. Like you have your discipline. You don't do, you can't do, I'm going to go jump on a bull and try that. You know? Well, I mean, you can. There are guys that, you know, compete in more than one event. Like Stet- Stetson Wright is, uh, he's arguably one of the very best bronc riders and bull riders going. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a lot more rare now. Uh, and you were just, saying because it's, because it's, you're. It's, it's just gotten really competitive, really specialized. Mm-hmm. The, the bucking horses have gotten and bulls have gotten so so good they're so rank um to you know if you you gotta go through a season and get on like i'll get on 100 to 150 bronx a year so if you i mean if you're doing that double time i mean that you're asking a lot of your body yeah you might be done when you're 24 yeah i also think and you can correct me if i'm wrong zeke in this but you know back in the days the old days of rodeo right these old cowboys that were trying to make a living rodeo and it didn't pay what it pays now. Mm-hmm. Like the the pool wasn't near as good, and so they were going to the rodeo. Like they would want to enter more than one event just to increase their odds of making some oh, money in order to yeah. make some more money to make it to the next rodeo. Whereas now, like at Zeke's level, and when these guys are going, these rodeos, especially these big rodeos, pay so good that if you are truly good at what you do, like Zeke, you can go and actually make a living in your one event and specialize nope. and save and preserve your body be hyper-focused on what you do, but earn a living enough that you can continue on down the road to the next Instead one. Instead of taking yes, Hail Marys you're, you're, on the back. Whereas right. like back yeah. in the yeah. day, it was like, hell, let's enter the bronc ride and the bull ride and the team rope and if somebody's got a horse, <laughs> that, and I'll do some yes. steer wrestling. Exactly. Right, too, that's I what need we beer did. money. See, if we, can't, see if we can't bring a little money home. Well, seriously, yeah. 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 And that's what you did at like the high school rodeos because they had an all-around and you wanted to get all-around points. Mm-hmm. College, you're on a college team, right? So you're trying to get your team to the college final. So you enter multiple events to get points total for the team. Um, when you get to the professional level, it seems like you kind of narrow in on one, one, one specific Speaking of narrowing in, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but I want to talk about the economics. So when I ask you about the economics of it, you don't need to talk about you, but you just talk about generally how it goes. Oh, yeah. Um, but first, this one's not terribly personal. Uh, what was the first time you you walked away with money from a rodeo? How old were you? Oh, like, I don't know, like probably one, you know, an envelope with 40 bucks at junior rodeos when I was little. But competing, like when I started actually to like make a little money was when I started riding steers in Canada as a boy steer rider. And at what age? Uh, that would have been like 11, 12. 
making money at 11 or 12. Yeah, that was awesome because you didn't drive and your parents paid for all the fuel. So it was all profit. <laughs> and then what would be making money? What do you mean? A few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks? Oh, I think that one year after I, w I won the Canadian title in the steer ride, and I think I had like $10,000 from Holy riding steers. Did your parents take it away from you? 14 year old kid, 13 year old kid. <laughs> Did your parents take it from you? <laughs> no. Really? Like, you have it? Yeah, yeah. You've just inspired tons me. of yeah. young people. Are, you, are you serious at that age? <laughs> I'm dead serious. It's yeah. way better than most. Was that regarded balls. as exceptional? Actually, I think I bought my first cows when I was, yeah, 14, 13, 14. <laughs> With my steer ride money. Just cowboy through and through. Cowboy, dude. yeah. You didn't buy an It would have been a great <laughs> opportunity for the I folks two, to be like, two black Angus cows. this is what uh, trailer tires cost. This is what uh, Oh, fuel yeah, you can see a lot of parents be like, oh, hand that over. You still owe me $100,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they actually had a big steer. Like, uh, like so it seems like every, like, my my age group, I guess, especially in Canada, but, but everywhere, like, through high school rodeo, through my steer ride and all that stuff, like, there was always, like, a big... A big group of kids that were, you know, that, that were really good at it and, and, and gamers. So, like, when we were riding steers, they actually put on a steer riding um, in Canada. And I think it paid, it paid like, 7000 to win it. Mm -hmm. And I won it the one year. And I got a, a, a one, a, a buck and bull cow. Like, I won an actual cow. Really? Yeah. What would you do with the cow? Just uh, sell it or bring no, it home? We just preg checked her three days ago. And she's, <laughs> she's still alive. So that still was producing. A, that was in 2008. <laughs> So that thing wound up paying a lot of money. So she's 2008, and yeah, this she's been bred every year. Oh, I raised two bucking bulls out of them. They did, out of hers. They didn't buck very hard, so I just started breeding her to a black Angus bull. You kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Do you mark that one so wow. you can track the so you can track the payoff on that win? <laughs> on the. I mean, do you mark how much you've made off that cow? Off that cow? No, I don't. I mean, I'm not It'd sure. Be interesting. The cattle no. market fluctuates a lot, but. Yeah. You can tell her. She really sticks out from the herd. She looks like a, she doesn't belong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty mean, too. So when you, so you, when you were, at, okay, so at, at 14, you started buying, you bought cows. Yeah. yeah. So you just knew you wanted to be in the family business. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, how many guys are there? U.S., Canada. I mean, I'm sure there's, I don't know how, far, just do your best job of answering this, because I'm sure you can start getting into, well, what about Mexico or whatever, but. Right. Like, give me a ballpark. How many, how many guys are there? that are making the bulk of their annual income bronc riding bronc riding mm. is it hundreds no like i mean it depends i guess how much what you consider income but yeah i get it because you could be you could like live in your parents basement yeah and make yeah 8, bucks but a i mean year. to yeah. to truly make a living riding bucking horses i would say the so like for us to rodeo throughout the year i'm gonna say you probably have around 70 70 thousand ish invested to go a full season um that's between like your your fuel your entry fees flights food um so you so you're to make the nfr you've got to win pro, like this year i think it took about a hundred and five thousand so they they mark it by just the purse mm -hmm. it's a dollar figure. Dollar, dollars one huh. so I mean, if you're making the NFR, you're coming out on, you know, you go to the NFR and don't win a dime, you're coming out on top with 30000 extra. You so, worked, worked pretty damn hard for that 30000 And took some years off your life, yes. maybe. <laughs> so you can look at someone there, like someone at that point has has pocketed, like at a minimum they maybe pocketed thirty grand. Like, yeah, I mean, that's to make it. But like your, yeah, top, yeah. your top guys... I mean, last year I went out to the Vegas. I won more money than any other contestant there, but I left just Vegas alone with two hundred and fifty-six thousand. And how many days of work was that? Ten days. Yeah, that was exceptional. That's good though. That's, that's, that's yeah, top that's, end. that's doing as good as you can do. Yeah, uh, taxes got to be a bitch on that stuff. Huh? Taxes, taxes suck. They pretty much act like you won the lottery. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of things you can write off against, you know, your rodeo. Too bad you income. can't write off your bones and shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that cost me. Yeah. That cost me my femur. Yeah. That's got to be worth something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do that as a deduction. <laughs> but I mean, if you're doing good and you're in the top five or whatever, I, I mean, you're making you're making a decent living. You're making. A you good know what's living. funny about that line of work too is I always think about this with professional athletes and stuff and, and others is uh, like when I was talking about economics and the personalness of economics is it's so public do you know what I mean like we had a guy on that won the British Open right 
and yeah, everybody knows how much. Yeah, he's you'd be making. like, I don't need to yeah, ask him. Yeah. I could like, I could in three seconds tell. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I could in three seconds. Yeah, everybody look and knows tell, how much I make. Yeah, it's so know? funny. So you come back from something, and people are like, "Hey, good luck on you know, good yeah. job on the blank dollars." Yeah, you know, there's no, no for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not too private, but I mean, like, uh, I lost my train of thought. No, just not, not private. Yeah. It's just public information. It's yeah. treated as the point system. To your point, though, right? Like, it so, is. Like, it's it is literally the points and the currency that is used to quantify what you've achieved in rodeo mm-hmm. is, is like the dollars is the, the dollars the won. Yes. And so earlier today when we were goose hunting, you know how Zeke was talking about you can only go to a hundred rodeos in a year. Mm-hmm. So you have to pick. So there might be seven or eight hundred rodeos, pro rodeos in the nation. The good guys like him and that top shelf group of guys, they're not going to like some podunk rodeo in podunk middle of nowhere, right? They're going to the big shows because that's going to pay the most dollars. And so it gets to the point where it's like, we're going to go to the least amount of rodeos we can and win the most amount of money to make it to the NFR and not kill ourselves in the meantime, but still make a living going. You have less travel costs, higher yeah, reward. That, that is what I was going to say was, yeah, so like rodeos, it's the only blue collar sport left where you pay your own way and you don't get paid unless you win. You know, where everybody else is on a contract. And so that's what makes rodeo pretty neat because you see like these guys are out that's there. That's interesting. Yeah, they I'm are, they are giving it their all every time and they're doing it because they want to, you know, you can, you can get drafted and sign your $3 million or your three year, $10 million contract and then, you know, go coast around the ice or football field or whatever pretty easily. But, you know, in rodeo there, you have to win. Because it's blue collar and draws from blue collar. Do you guys have a real reputation for blowing your money? Um, I don't know if they have or a reputation. Or do you see a lot of guys that are smart with I wouldn't, their money? I wouldn't say rodeo cowboys are smart with their money. No. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've done a pretty good job, but... You see a lot the, of money get the, blown, The though? majority of them, yeah. You see a lot of people burn a check up? Yeah, somebody will win, you know, a Houston for 50000 and then they buy a new boat. They're like, what? Are you, when are you ever going to use that? <laughs> <laughs> you're rodeoing all summer. You yeah. can't even... You're gone. You're not going to go to the lake. Could you... So could you... Uh, it's a hundred grand... Right, the entry, you, the, the 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 point system is a hundred thousand dollars to make the NFR. To make like, NFR. I mean, it fluctuates every year. So let's say you're gaming out, and and you can you can do a maximum of one hundred events. Is that right? Yeah, rodeos. yeah. You, you, get rodeos. you can't go more than yeah. that. Top fifteen in the world. Qualify. Is there a minimum? A minimum, like so. For us, we have what they call standalone events, which are and and the bull riders do too. And a, and a few in the bareback riding, but it's they they call them extreme bronx, where it's just bronc riding. Okay. So like if Bozeman was to have an extreme bronx, you would come and watch thirty of the best bronc riders in the world get on. That's all you'd watch is thirty bronc riders. Um, so a lot. I mean, in the PRC organization, like it, it they feel like it kind of takes away from rodeos that are adding, you know, that have a full rodeo. Got it. So in order for us to, you know, for your extreme Bronx money to count, you have to go to a minimum of 40 rodeos. Oh, okay. Because they're trying to keep the whole the whole program you, rolling. Yeah, because we could go, I mean, we have a lot of extreme Bronx now. Like, you could go to 40 extreme Bronx, win 100 grand in that, you know, but not not get your 40 rodeos, so that 100,000 is not counting towards the standing. That, that's what I was curious, yeah. is if, to what degree do people game it, meaning if you knew that, if you know that going to NFR, that you're a real contestant, and you might walk away with a sizable chunk of money, and you're going through the season, and you hit the minimum threshold, is there some part of you that says, I'm not going to risk my body unnecessarily. I'm just going to chill and and wait and just go to the big time and not do the circuit. Yeah, not not necessarily. Like As far as... As far as the rough stock events go, the bronc riding is the easiest on, on your body. It like kind of once you once you learn it, um, not that you ever have it totally learned, but um, they, they call it the classic event. Um, it's it's all timing and balance. You know, it's it's kind of like riding a rocking chair when it's going right. So, I mean, for us, it's. I mean, if you have a good horse drawn that you're going to win on, you're going to go get on it. Got um, it. If you have the, say you have the finals made, you know, halfway through the year, you might be a little more picky and choosy and maybe not go get on this horse that, you know, is known for sucking. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the other side of the coin, you might be on the bubble to make the NFR and you have to go get on everything. Yep. Yeah. And right. if you don't go, you don't get paid. No. Like it's just a net loss in dollars. Yeah. Yeah. 
I want to uh, go off of that analogy of the rock, rock and chair, um, <laughs> because I'd like you to go through if, if you can. Well, first, tell me. I think you can tell me re- really quickly. Is the is what you're mimicking when you do this bronc riding event? Is it what used to be or still is probably, but breaking a horse to be able to ride it with a saddle? Or is there something Not other? Really. There's no. something else that goes on in ranching that this is mimicking. Yeah. So like where where rodeo and bronc like bronc riding is the event that started rodeo, and where it came from was when the European settlers came over, they took the Spanish vaqueros influence on how to handle cattle with horses and they you know they seen that as a benefit so they started to you know handle cattle that way um you know before fences you would have a big roundup and everybody would gather all the cattle together and put them in a big herd a big mob whatever you want to call it and they would call it the roe deer and that's where you know all the ranches would get together they'd work work their cattle and then you would take your calves and go ship them and that guy would take his and go ship them so that's you know that's what they would do and uh kind of in the midst of all this you know they would be out there for months at a time and in the midst of all this they rode they would you know they'd have their cowboys or their day hands that would come and you know that worked for that ranch and they would do all the work but like back in those days like nowadays we start colts at two years old uh back then they would get on horses that you know were untouched by people when they're you know they'd be eight nine ten year old horses so you'd have to blindfold them. They'd tie a back leg up, snub them up, you know, whatever, and get. And usually, you know, most most of them cowboys had to have some sort of a bronc ride that morning just to just to get his horse snapped out and and then take off and go do their work for the day. So that's, I mean, cowboys being cowboys turned it into a competition of hey, I you know. Like, taking, I, taking I, I dare you to get on that crazy ass wages, horse. Like, hey, yeah. I can, so, but, I can ride that. So it, you know, this is the rankest horse. I can ride him, or you, you, you couldn't ride my horse, kind of thing. And uh, so it would be like a daily event. You just knew back then to, for them to guys. Start your day. You'd have to get on that horse in some weird way that you just described. I didn't understand half the terminology, but you'd have to get on him, go through eight or maybe a minute of craziness, and then you go about your day of work. Yes, and they would ride him once and considered him broke. <laughs> like that was a broke horse, but he might buck for the next sixty days that you yeah. saddle him. <laughs> Which is the fact that he had been ridden, the, that somebody had been on his back at one point. He was considered broke, but so that's oh. what they did. So then, you know, I, we got a body who, uh, uh, well, our body's body. Who's that guy? I remember we were squirrel <laughs> hunting down. We're talking about mules, squirrel hunting with Clay, and he had his friend with us. I can't remember the guy's name. He was funnier than hell. Who? He was. We're there. They got to talking about the the mule trade on Craigslist, and they're talking about like how bad Craigslist is for the mule trade. And, and this guy <laughs> says, "Man, I broke. I sold." <laughs> He says, I sold a crazy horse, or I sold a crazy mule to a guy on Craigslist, and two weeks later, I saw that same mule being sold as a broke mule. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how they did it. Yeah. yeah. So then they, I mean, obviously it turned into, you know, the, the art of bronc riding um, just came from those everyday working cowboys, you know, making bets and, and trying to ride the rankest horse, and then... Um, it it just kind of pro- progressively got sportier over the years, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I think maybe like somewhere in the early 1900s is when they, um, like when the Calgary Stampede put on their first, you know, outdoor Calgary Stampede, you know, and brought contestants from the United States and Mexico and all over to come compete. And um, I think Guy Wiedek was maybe the guy that kind of started like, put the rules kind of in place to, you know, make it more of a structured contest. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of evolved from there. Are there any other continents um, where this goes on? Do you know about? Uh, There are, but like in different styles. Okay. Um, Like, I don't know, I've like seen videos like on, on social media. I don't know even what country it'd be from, but like these guys get on, like they'll have these horses snubbed up. And they'll get on, like, maybe to a post and another horse be, be between two, you know, two riders on a horse. And they'll kind of sandwich the horse up, and this guy will crawl on. And then he'll have a quirt. And I honestly do not know how they stay on, but they'll have a bit in the horse's mouth. And, like, they, they don't really buck. They, don't, they buck nothing like ours, but they're, it's more of, like, a rearing mm-hmm. style of bucking. And these guys will ride these horses. Um, over in Brazil, they ride with, like, a... A saddle that's got like a handle on it. Okay, you know. Um, so there, I mean, there's different variations of it. What's the significance of the one hand in the air? 
Yeah, just difficulty level, I guess. Just showing that you're only using one yeah. hand. And then, mm. uh, you know the famous Wyoming symbol? Who's that dude? I don't actually know It's like who a famous that is. guy, right? Yeah, I don't know who that is. Like on the, okay. Can you, Tom Horn, maybe. Can you take, <laughs> can you take us through... Uh, and pick up wherever you decide it's like interesting enough to to tell the the story but take us through like step by step moment by moment the whole riding experience yeah, yeah. of when you get into that shoot but it might it might start i don't know 2 minutes ahead of time like when you're the other dude's riding ahead of you you're back there you're getting jacked up just kind of take us through everything that's in your head and as that process goes down cuz i think like when i watch it on tv like they get on whatever animal, and you always see see them Jimmy Dicking with that rope and that mm-hmm. and that tether or whatever it is. I mean, I kind of think, oh, he's making it tighter, but obviously there's more to it than just that. So it'd be it'd be cool if you could just take us through through the steps. What is roughly just thirty seconds, I'm guessing in in, in its entirety, but it'd yeah. probably take you five or ten minutes. Yeah, to so like it. we try to get to the rodeo an hour before. Um, you get your equipment kind of ready. And, just an hour. Yeah, yeah. Usually, I mean that's. It's about what it takes. You warm up your body, get everything firing. Um, you know, you go get a halter. It's they supply the halter, so you go get a halter. Put your hack rein on your halter. Um, bronc riding is usually, you know, pretty commonly in the middle of the rodeo. So usually about third to fourth event in. So you'll kind of you'll help your buddies on in the bareback riding, watch them do their thing, and then uh, they start loading broncs. And it's you get you get your gear on, put your vest, your shaps. Um, all that, you take your saddle over yeah, there. Yeah, what's that? That vest is protective, right? Yeah, it's a protective vest. It's got like Kevlar plates or yeah, something, was it? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's like a, it's just kind of like a thick foam, um, covered oh. in leather. Okay, so, so it wouldn't, it doesn't help you get Not stomped bulletproof. on. No. It, it helps, yeah. Like, oh, it, so that, that padding will help you get stomped It's to like disperse on? the, you know, I got you. yeah. Yep. It, like, and anything, like we don't, I mean, hopefully you don't have to use it for getting stepped on. I mean, it's not super common, but it's nice to have it on when you do, but. Um, some horses, you know, like if they, some old smart horses will, you know, try to set back in the chute and, you know, kind of mash you in the back of the chute, you know? Gotcha. So it's nice to have it on for that. And that stuff's yours or not yours? It's mine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, you have, you. But you, you go get the, the, you were talking about getting the, the other equipment. The, the halter. halter. The, the halter. The halter. That, that's not, you can't bring your own. That is brought by the stock contractor. Just usually because they, well, I mean, you just wouldn't want to pack a halter around, but they also have like their rodeo company's name on the mm-hmm. nose band and. There's some famous special horses have their own name on the oh, noseband okay. and stuff. What about the saddle? When does that go on and who provides that? So they'll like once they start loading the bucking horses for the bronc riding, you'll go find your horse, um, you know, figure out what shoot or what side you're 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 on. Um, you take your equipment over there, you'll put, start by putting your halter on the horse. And at um, this point you know what that horse looks like. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you've probably known what it looked like ask, days before. Who, yeah. yeah. Um you always go and talk to the stock contractor beforehand and always be friendly, shake their hand, ask him what side he's out of, you know, blah, blah, do that kind of deal. But then, uh, what do you mean what side he's out of? Like, so there's at the rodeo, well, most rodeos, not all, but there'll be a left hand delivery and a right hand delivery. And that depends on the horse's tendencies. Of, yes. So some horses oh, are oh. right leaded and some horses are left lead, just like people. Oh, so they tailor it to what that horse is going to want to do. So like some horses, yeah. So if a okay. horse likes to kind of circle to the left, they'll put him out of the left side so that he can, you know, he starts in the left lead and goes out there and makes a oh. circle to the left. Okay. Um, They're not just know. mixing it up randomly. No, okay. no. There's actually, there's a lot of strategy that goes into it. Yeah, I got you. But uh, yeah, you get your horse altered. I'll put my saddle on. Um, so you put your saddle on? Yep. Yeah. Personal saddle. I'm responsible for all of my own equipment, my stuff. Okay. Yeah. Like, so basically when you enter the rodeo and you get there and you're going to go compete on that horse, like that, that horse is basically my horse for the time being. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm doing everything with it. And obviously the stock contractor owns it and you work with them to, you know. Make, but the saddle's got to fit best. like criteria, right? You can't invent some genius saddle. No, that... no. There's specs for a saddle, yeah. um, you know, where they where they sit and how they pull and got and it. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I'll put my saddle on and then uh, usually about the time the bronc riding's starting to kick off, wherever, you know, wherever you happen to fall in the lineup, like you might be first out, you might be 12th or 13th out. Mm-hmm. depending on uh, how many guys and so you'll uh kind of time it like to do my shafts up and and get them tight you know probably five or six guys ahead of me start pulling my horse which is you know start cinching your saddle down uh, but, now what are the chaps doing for you because you're not riding through briars 
No. So the shaps are their 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 leg protection, um, and then we also put rosin on our swells, okay. which is where your legs come in contact with your saddle. So it's it's kind of a sticky, you know, it's a sticky tree sap. Rosin. And it looks sweet too, right? Yeah, and oh. style too. <laughs> But, uh, and yeah. that helps you grip the horse? Is yeah, it helps lo- you grip your saddle. And you're allowed um, to rosin it. Yes, sir. Because mm-hmm. yeah. in baseball, you're not. No, they grip their, they, they rosin their bats, don't they? Well, no, they can't put sticky shit on the ball, though. No, not on the oh, ball. Yeah. Yeah. But you guys are allowed to. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, there's criteria on that, too. Like, you yeah. can't, can't be painting on Gorilla Glue. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, so then, depending on where I am in the lineup, I'll, I'll start, you know, cinching my horse, pulling my saddle. Um, I get everything squared away and then it's, uh, it's basically just go time. Everything, uh, you know, they get a couple guys away from me. I'll suck my hat down, put my mouth guard in. Uh, you measure your rain cause each horse takes a, a different rain measurement depending on where they hold their head, um, when they buck, and how they buck. And so, uh, you have somebody hold the horse's head straight, um, out in front of, and, uh, you just pull your rein across there and measure it from the back of your swells. Um, like a one, a fist with your thumb sticking out is considered an average. So if I was going to give a horse what they call X and four, I would give them an average plus four fingers. And so measure my rein. Once my rein's measured, mm, I, I take, got you. take my back cinch. So you'll snug your back so cinch So I, I feel like, yeah, from watching, I feel like I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. 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 So then I'll snug my back cinch And this up. is all happening fast, though, It happens man. fast. Because they want, like, for the spectator's perspective, they want, like, a certain cadence, right? Oh, in Vegas, like, they want, like, you have to have your back cinch, you know, rain measured foot in your saddle as the other guy before you is going. So like they just snap them out one bam, at bam, one, bam, yeah, bam, one yeah. after another as fast as they can. So it's fun to watch. Yeah, regular you, rodeo. It's not quite. Who's quite doing that the intense. backs? Are you doing the back cinch? I do the back cinch. Yeah, you do. And then the the stock on tractor is in charge of the flank, and then not, like usually like I I like to get my own guy. Sometimes there's a guy supplied, but um, you have somebody what you call like your head man, and that's the guy that will turn the horse's head out of the chute once the chute gate is opened. Um, most of the horses that we get on, you know, they're They've done it so much that you don't, you don't really, you don't touch and, them. And you feel that horse is fired up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like they like it. They, they, yes. Yeah, so there's some horses that they'll run in the buck and shoot and they'll just swell right up and get tight. You can tell that, you know, they're ready. There's other horses <laughs> that will stand in there and they act half asleep and you're like, come on, wake up, man. Like we gotta, we gotta go do this. You know, uh-huh. they, they all have a personality. Um, they're all different and, uh, yeah. But anyways, I'll, I'll step over the back, crawl down on. And, um, once like, once I'm crawling over the buck and shoot it, like, I don't hear anything. Like, I don't hear the announcer. Um, uh, you might communicate with the stock contractor or your helper that's there. Um, and then after that, you take a deep state and far away look and nod your head. Far away look. Yeah. Okay. So you, you <laughs> nod, you nod your head. One guy swings the chute open. So the, when the gate starts to open, the, like, so like all I can see is I'm focused on the horse's neck. Um, I can see my rein up in front of me. So like, as soon as that horse's head starts to move, like she's, you know, he or she is committing to leaving the chute is when I'll reach up and spur them out, um, get a hold of them with my feet. Then I'll have to hold my feet in the front of her, you know, above her shoulders or his shoulders until the front feet hit the ground. Ideally, how they teach it is you want to have, you want to spur the horse out for two jumps, which means you, you know, you spur you leave your feet in the front of the neck for t- the first two jumps. And then after that, you have to pick up the timing and you want to beat the horse to the ground with your spur stroke. So as that horse is breaking and coming coming over and then as it starts to kick and come back to the ground, you want to already have your feet in its neck. It, w- but what is that for? Uh, you can, it's... <laughs> You you can honestly ride. You could they couldn't blow you out of there with a cannon if you're if you're ahead of the horse. Um, so that's why they they call it the classic venters. It's, it's like riding a rocking chair. If you get behind and you know you're you're spurring, you're hitting the front as the horse's front feet are hitting the ground, or even after it, you take you take all the power of the horse. So that's when you start to see guys like when they get their chin popped and they're you know getting strung out and then it just turns your ride progressively like i mean you can catch up and get ahead of them again it'll cause you to mess up a jump or two which obviously reflects in your score or it can just kind of foul up the entire ride and and, if you're out of time yes yeah what's the significance of the we're not there yet 
But uh, what is the significance of eight seconds? Like, where did that ever come from? I don't know. It used to be used to be ten. Okay, I think um, they just shortened it. I, I'm not really sure. So it's not like a Spanish tradition or something. No, I don't, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure where the eight seconds come from. Okay, yeah. But you, how how well do you know when you're there? Oh, like well, they have a horn that goes off. I know, so but you do you know anyways that. though? You, yeah, you have a you have an internal clock and you have a pretty good idea. Uh. How far into the ride do you know if it's going to be a spectacular ride or it's a dud? Yeah, just I mean, you can. It kind of depends on the ride. Like you know, you get on a horse, maybe the first three or four jumps are, you know, outstanding, and it's looking like you're going to be eighty eight, and then he kind of peters out or trails off at the end and. You know, his last three jumps was a 77, so then you end up being 82. Um, yeah. So basically, you see riders get off. I used, to, well, I used to be confused about, but this this conversation is how I'm explaining it. As you see riders get off, you know, and you think they tore it up, and they get off and they're pissed. Yeah. It's kicking the dirt, throwing it. And I was like, what? You, 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 you still got might all be, your that teeth. Might be yeah, you know, they they never did. fell off. Yeah. And they're, just, they, they're pissed because the horse. Yeah, they know. I mean, it could be or something, you know, maybe something that they... They maybe uh, weren't happy with themselves that they did. Yeah. Um, no, the intricacies of the scoring horse, explain If your horse it, you know? bucks hard from start to finish and you ride it really well, you're going to get a big score, no matter what. Zeke, oh, you, oh, you said uh, you snug down your hat. Aren't a lot of folks wearing like full face protection and helmets these days? In the bull riding. Just the bull riding? Yeah, no, no bronc riders wear helmets. I mean, there's maybe one. Wow. So one smart bo- bronc rider in the, out of the whole crew. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I think he wore a helmet because he had a soft spot on his skull from a previous injury. That makes sense. He's late, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's late to the game. Yeah. yeah. His nickname was Helmet. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You'll know him when you see him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Old skid lid. How, how, often do you, how often do you get, like, what percentage of the time do you get thrown off? Well, I don't know. I mean, this year I've been bucked off twice, I guess. Uh-huh. And what's the most common? Um, so that'd weight? be like, wait, that that'd be like two percent. Yeah, it's just less likely to happen, right? And when you get bucked off, are you like, I screwed up, or is it that that horse had an amazing move? Um, yeah, it's usually it's it's on me, obviously, because it's. I mean, the horse is your dancing partner. They're out there making the. They're in the lead, right? And mm-hmm. you're making the counter move. So obviously, if I get bucked off, there's you know, I I didn't do something correct, but. Uh, there's, there's, there's just times, I mean, you, it, you can't, it's inevitable. It's going to happen, uh, especially if you get on enough of them. Um, so like the other day at the Canadian finals, they bucked me off the first round and, uh, I knew it was coming a, a horse that had bucked, you know, all the, all the best bronc riders going off that same way. And I, I figured out a pretty good game plan for her and she did, she did to me what she does to everybody else. But you knew that it was coming and what it might be. But I was doing every, like I watched the tape back and I was doing it, I was doing everything pretty correct. What was it, what was she doing? What was the thing? Like she just turns out of there and like the first two jumps are really big and um, I had her spurred out and I was going to hold my feet for two jumps. So like the second jump uh, or like the first jump was, is pretty good. Like it's a big jump, but like she's pretty honest about it. The second jump, she like, really elevates and and moves away what they call so like she starts to really jump forward Mm -hmm. which makes you want to run out the back of your saddle but then on top of that like what is your your balance point or your pivot point is your bronc rein with that she move is moving forward but then giving her giving her head back to you so you got nothing to pull well that's that's the thing you always all the pressure like your the pressure on your rein is what holds your butt down in your saddle got it so when she's starting to make a 30 foot jump that way Plus, giving her, her head that way, I just slid out the back and she bucked oh. me off. But looking and at you, back, like, like, that was, you, I was you, doing you were most aware things. aware that that could happen. Yeah. yeah how she's are you done it to everybody. Count, how are you going to counter Yeah, did it? you learn something? Do you feel like... I don't know. I watched the thing and I was like, I, I don't know what I would do different. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah. I mean, there's a, I'll probably draw her again and I'll, I'll probably try it the same way. <laughs> I, w- I was doing yeah. things pretty, pretty right. <laughs> huh. Yeah. yeah. So, uh... What are the, you laid out a number of injuries to talk about the woman, you're a kid, but like, like at your level now, what's the thing that you worry about happening? Like, like what would be the thing that winds up banging you up? You don't really worry about any of it happening. I mean, obviously it, it can happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're worried about getting hurt, you probably shouldn't do it. But, um, I mean, it's, it's a high contact sport for sure. And, yep. and injuries are going to happen. Big ones for bronc riders, um, groins, knees, 
um, ankles. I, I seem to do a knee or an ankle every year. So is it is it mostly like twisting and falling? Yeah, like, more like than ligament get, stuff. Um, more than getting like more than getting stepped on or banged into into the into the arena walls. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, things do happen. Like wrecks in the bronc riding are. I mean, they're they're few and far between. Uh, for the most part, I mean, you can you can get into a situation that is just unavoidable and and get kind of wiped out or whatever. But um, like like for me this year, like I I sprained the snot out of my ankle pretty good, and it was just getting off on the pickup man. Um, I just got off and stepped in a hole wrong and and rolled oh, my ankle. You know, undramatic. Uh, yeah, very very just, just not even a cool story. Yeah, but um, you know, like knees twisting the wrong way and stirrups. Like say you're getting bucked off or coming off. And your stirrup hangs on your on your foot for a second and, and twists your knee the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ligaments and knees and, and groins seem to be, be hard on brown craters. Got it. Uh, is there a lot of groupies in the rodeo world? Um, I mean, there's some. No. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Yeah. I see you're married, though, huh? I'm married, yeah. How long have you been married? I've been married. This will be, well, I just had my anniversary the other day, seven years. Oh. Yeah. What's going on with that? Going good? Oh, it's really good. I have... Uh, we got three kids. We just welcomed our third one two weeks ago. Uh, my oldest daughter, Lucy, is five. I got a boy, Hardy. He's two. And then uh, Maggie is two weeks old. Damn. Got it going on. Yeah. You like being married, though? I love being married. Yeah, that's the right answer. That's the right yeah. answer on the podcast. Have yeah. <laughs> yeah. you really dumb? What, Say something um, different. <laughs> like, what's the gap between you and the other guys going in? Because the NFR, what, when this drops is two weeks away what's the gap between you and the other guys like between me and first yeah uh probably like right around thirty thousand. um which ain't much because last year i think first place had one hundred and fifteen thousand on me and i caught him you're kidding me yeah same number oh no probably not the same number um did you guys did you guys both hit the 100 mark or no uh yeah, like what do you like the like they're, how, many, they're, how many they're way over that. Yeah. Yeah, like for the year one right now, I think I have two hundred and twenty three thousand one or something. No, no, no. I meant when you said like the guy being over, I said I meant um when you look at like who's top, does it matter how many events they took place in? Oh, like how many I got you. Yeah, no, it you can go to you can use all hundred or you can use I mean, I usually use around you know, eighty. Okay. 75 to 85. And is that a common number? Yeah, most guys. I mean, some guys like to make sure they use all 100 and give themselves the very best chance. Yep. Um, Other guys, you know, like for me, I have a lot of other things going on at home and stuff. So, I mean, I, I mean, going to 80 rodeos for me, that's, that's, that's really doing it. So if you're on a plane and someone says, what do you do for a living? What do you say? It's the hardest thing to explain to people. You say you're a rancher. They look at you, they think you're crazy. You tell them you're a professional bronc rider, and they're like, "What's that?" <laughs> like my ass. <laughs> like I'm a I'm a gypsy that travels around <laughs> and gets on horses that try to throw me off. So you will tell people that's what you do. Oh yeah. yeah. And some people, some people are are you know you'll run into people on airplanes that are huge rodeo fans that you wouldn't even think. Uh-huh. And other people, you know, might be upstate New York and have, don't even know what end the feed goes in the horse. Yeah. <laughs> I only ever someone if I'm ever in that conversation, I only ever say that I say I'm a writer, and they go what, and I say books and magazine stuff. Yeah, that's all I ever say. Yeah. I never. But and I people go, oh, goods. I'm familiar with books and magazines. <laughs> yeah. I read one myself. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I can picture hmm. at some point in your life, you'd just be like, yeah, ranching. Ranching. Yeah. Because yeah. if you say cowboy, they're like, cowboy. my ass. Yeah. <laughs> one, thing to, one thing to note, you know, when he said that, you know, they could be $30,000 from the next guy, those guys take their yearly earnings, and then once they get to the NFR, there's 10 rounds. Mm-hmm. Each round of the NFR pays really good. So, like, last year, what was it, like, $28,000? I think, yeah, 30 this year. $30,000 30, to win this year. one round of the NFR. So you got 10 goes. So oh. say on night one you show up and, and Zeke wins round one of the NFR and the guy who is ahead of him doesn't win any money, well, now they're tied. And oh, so gotcha. what will happen is you have this year-long race to get to the top 15 to get to the NFR. But as soon as you get to the NFR – Man, there's been times when the guy who came in in 15th place has jumped up ahead and won a world title because it's your year yeah. and money. So it's the year and the NFR. And so for the for for these guys just getting to the NFR, they'll make oftentimes more money at the NFR in 10 days than they made in the rest of their whole season. Oh, yeah. I got yeah. a strategy. You got to get hot it, at man. the NFR. I'm, the more we're talking, man, I'm really seeing a 
<laughs> an approach where you just sandbag it all year and just go down there and tear it a new one, man. That that's a good strategy. <laughs> I don't know. The <laughs> problem is you got to draw good to do that every. But you got to make yeah. it though, which means if you make it, you got to be. You, I mean, if you make the NFR, you're doing pretty good. It's hard to make. Yeah, I got you. So like, there's probably 400 bronc riders that hold a PRCA card. I don't. I'm just guessing somewhere in there. Mm. Only 15 of them get to go to the NFR. God. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like there's what no we're missing here is there's like a f- quite a few people that would say they're professional bronc riders that don't go to the NFR. Yeah, but remember like the, the vast remember majority. Brian, yeah. yeah, but Brian Harmon, were you here when the professional golfer Brian Harmon was on? No. There's some golden ticket. Like, what was he saying? There's but, like a golden ticket. If you win something or another, oh. you get to skip all the BS and you know you're going. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you win a master, yeah, it, yeah. I think well, is what it was. Not, yeah, um, uh, a, um, not a... A master's is one of the, I believe, four majors. And if you win That's a right. major, you skip then, all the BS. Then you are, are you keep get to keep your card for like whatever he said. Yeah, five, it's five, a point system. System. They don't have that no. rodeo. No. Like, uh, like you win, they're like, buddy, take it yep. off. Take it easy. Next for the year, year, you got to do it all over again <laughs> from scratch. Yep. Yeah. So, what, uh, right now, how, how long do you think you'll ride for? Are you just going to wait it out or do you got like an exit plan? No, I mean, and it's, I'll probably just know, I'll know when I know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm healthy. I feel really good. So I got, I got some good years left in me. And, um, what does your wife support you doing that kind of work? She likes it. Oh yeah. She, I wouldn't be able to do it without her. She's, she's been there with me every, every step of the way. And got it. Yeah. She's, she's not telling you to hang She's just up. as much a part of it as I am. Got it. She travel with you? A little bit. Yeah. 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 And you, are you able to bring your kids now and then? Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they don't go a ton. Like they obviously will get to quite a few of the Canadian rodeos and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then like kind of the end of the season when we're winding down that's like september like so they come to pendleton um hung out there for a week you know go to go to a few do you I, think you're gonna have any riders in your family the kids I don't know. my little boy he really he, i mean he's two so it's hard to tell but he, he sure acts like he wants to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, all uh, he does the really, cool yeah the it's cool a rubber family bowl aspect all he rides. um and i think it's like this is why i think well for a lot of reasons why i think pro rodeo is the best professional sport so I went to Great Falls to uh-huh. watch Zeke. Jan and I get in the stands, and I'm texting Zeke as they're loading up the bucking horses, and Zeke's not there yet, right? Like, he's still, like, walking up. Rodeo started. He was traveling with his daughter, walks up to the announcer stand, and drops his daughter off with the announcer, <laughs> right? Goes over, leaves keep her. Eye, to keep an eye on her. Yeah. Yeah, give her a good seat. <laughs> yeah, good seat. Gives her his phone so she can videotape him, Right. Goes over, saddles his own horse, bucks out what? That was like an 89 or something like that, that night. Yeah. Uh, won the go-round. Won the rodeo. Won the rodeo. How much was that? Uh, I don't I mean, know what I know Great I Falls has added. So maybe got 8,000 added or right. something. So Decent. 4, and 000. then he gets off. It was just this amazing ride, too. We're watching it. He gets off. You see him walk up to his daughter. Ten minutes later, I get a text. And he's like, hey, meet you in the Buffalo Wings uh, parking lot. <laughs> And it was like, that's pro rodeo. Yeah. Like, where else, what other professional sport do you see that? I yeah, know. no, I can see it. I can see the appeal from that angle. Yeah. Like he says, like, the only blue-collar sport left, right? I got yeah. one follow-up. You mentioned earlier that uh, the, um, now I'm going to forget that, not the cinch, but the flank strap. Yeah. That there's a myth that it, like, cinches up the testicles, and that's what yeah. makes them buck. I've, I've been told that. Yeah. So <laughs> that's I, what everybody I, asks. I, yeah. So everybody just, like, set, set, the, set it straight for, for that strap. Okay. So the flank strap is just, it's just a piece of, it's just a leather strap, and then it, it's covered in sheepskin, or, like, wool. Yeah. And it's the equivalent to you, you know, tightening up your belt. Like the horses and the animals are bred to do it. That it's just um, basically an encourager um, for them to kick. So they you put a flank on. Like they'll still buck without the flank, um, but the flank just encourages them to kick harder and higher. Um, so it's just it's just a leather strap. It's got a quick release buckle on it. So um, right, because so after the ride, you see the, the helper cowboys. Come in. Yep, they ride and in. Release it. Yeah, so and it's then got, usually they quit. Bucking. It's got an eight foot latigo on it. Two rings on each end with quick quick release buckle. They've got the sheep skin that goes, you know, around the horse's, um, around its midsection or whatever. They pull the flank, um, you know, the horse goes out there, bucks, they, the, the whistle goes, the ride's over, the pickup men ride in, they trip the quick release, the flank falls on the ground, out the horse goes. The other, one other quick thing to note, when you look at flank straps on horses and bulls, anatomically, it would be impossible to go around their 
testicles or oh, anything yeah. like that. Like it'd anatom- have, yeah, it'd have to be on anatomically, there like a, it doesn't work. So it, yeah, it's a, it'd have to be like it a doesn't, it doesn't work. Like and and horses, like they they don't perform under like if you have a saddle that doesn't fit right, um, it can you know and it is pinching the horse you know somewhere that and it's you know inflicting pain. It could take you know maybe the best bucking horse in the world and make it have a terrible day. Because mm. like you, you can inflict pain, like they don't they don't perform under under those circumstances. A bull riding flank is a six foot cotton rope with a ring on it. So when you um, no 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 genitalia, involved. they're no different than us. If you're in pain, you're not going to perform your sport at the highest level. And my belt's not around my gonads. Yeah, right. Lucky for you, right now it's not. <laughs> so, but is that it? Like, so it must be somewhat of a trained thing, then, right? Like as they're. They only get that strap when this one thing happens, right? So yeah. they know, yeah. oh, the strap's on. It's time. It's go time. Yeah. yeah. Remember how in the beginning we were talking about like the second act, you know, that you might retire from this and go on to something? You'll just go so seamlessly into ranching though, right? Yeah. I mean, f- for sure. I got a lot of hobbies that I'm pretty excited to get time to do. Yeah. You're going to go home and hunt right now. I'm going to do a lot of hunting, um, ranching. You got three um, weeks to hunt right now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go hunt, hunt before the NFR. Mm-hmm. Um, mule deer, mule deer, white tail. My wife has a cow elk draw. She likes to hunt. She likes to hunt. That's great. Yeah. Friend of mine, uh, Alberta gal, just whacked a really nice mule deer. So there's one less for you. He showed me some yeah. pictures that are pretty amazing. Well, yeah. He showed me a bunch. Where's she from? Uh, Calgary. Right okay. near. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. gonna say she's right from your ranch. Yeah. That's like she's on, <laughs> exactly. She was on my place. <laughs> <Exactly. Yeah. laughs> Everybody knows, Everybody knows your schedule. Everybody knows your schedule. She parachuted in. Yeah, she yes. parachuted yeah. in your place, yeah. man. Yeah. And then, um, uh, so do, are you in the cattle business now too? Are yeah. You, are you like you're invested in cattle? Yeah. So like we yeah we run we have we have some me and my wife have some cow calf pairs mama cows. Yep. Um, and then you know it, for what I do it works better for for us because we're gone so much in the winter rodeoing is we run what they call grassers. Um, it's kind of the middle phase of you know, the beef industry. Um, so we get yearlings in in the spring, mm-hmm. run them on grass all summer before they go to the feedlots. And they're out the door. And then uh, we don't have them around in the you wintertime. Don't over, you don't overwinter anything? No, so we don't. Because we have, we have a place in Texas and, and all the winter rodeos start in January. So me and the family, we load up, head to Texas. And, uh, oh, so you'll down base there. down there for the winter stuff? Yeah, for about three months. We usually leave right after right after Christmas or New Year's and, and be down there till you know, the first, first or second week of April. Do you guys got to homeschool your kids? Um, well, I mean, Lucy's just, this is her first year of kindergarten, so. Oh, they've been so I mean, little. Yeah, yeah, they're still pretty you little. And, and she'll that, just, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, she'll just take her schoolwork with her and, and yeah. stuff for this the first few years. Mm-hmm. Um, when she gets a little older, I'm not sure what we'll do. But uh, yeah, we don't, we don't keep, try to not to keep too many animals around in the wintertime just because just we're not home. Yeah. So uh, on this mule deer hunt, do you got like a, that you're going to embark on tomorrow, presumably. Do you got like a, um, a goal in mind? You got a buck you've been watching? Actually, uh, that's that's the other downside of rodeo is I'm, I don't get to be around enough in September and October. You're out of the league? Um, to, to know what's around. I do know, I haven't seen late eyes on them, but they, uh, the neighbors say there's there's a, a cranker not far away. Really? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll probably be poking around looking for him. Uh-huh. Rifle or archery? Rifle. And it's spot and stock mule deer hunting, right? I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah. Got you. And when you guys are hunting whitetails, you hunt them down the bottoms, like river bottoms? Um, so like we live four miles off of east of the Red Deer River. Um, you'll get whitetails, mule deers down there. Um, but we, we got enough, like there's enough mixture between pasture and grain farming where we're at that mm-hmm. the the whitetail get in like the poplar brush and stuff, yep. you know, bed in there in the day and then they come out and feed and in the evening and stuff. So there's actually, there's, there's a lot of both around. Mm. Um, and you, you don't farm at all. I, I own some farm ground. Um, I don't farm it myself. It, it gets farmed by my in-laws for me. Oh, I got it. Yeah. But you'll hunt that farm. Ground. I'll hunt that. Oh yeah. All right. And then you were saying, yeah, you guys got some moose running around. Yeah. We got moose, elk. Um, but it's hard to get the moose tag. Yeah. You're probably, you're an eight on the moose. I'll probably, yeah, you're probably eight years Get, and then you, get how, your bull moose draw. How often will you draw a bull elk tag? I mean, you can just buy an over-the-counter archery tag, um, but I think you're probably you're probably seven on your on your elk. 
Got it. Just keep in mind, like I've been applying for moose here in Montana since I was 12 or, yeah. And he's no closer to getting that tag than he was when he was 12. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. For me to be like, oh, I will, is just like a fun game to play with myself. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Dude, I got to tell you, on a scale of 1 to 10 in rodeo knowledge, dude, that was like a 1. On rodeo knowledge? Prior. Now I'm like a 10. You're a 10 now. <laughs> Maybe a 12. <laughs> Nine. See, yeah. for me, the I know, I know. duck decoys, yeah, I was any, like... Any ne- future questions, Yanni, bring them to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on rodeo. Goose decoys, I was like a negative two before this morning. <laughs> Brady got me lined out. I'm I'm freaking 10. Mm-hmm. It, I can set we're gonna, some decoys We're going to do it up. again. <laughs> yeah, Brady's coming to Alberta. Yeah, me and Matt, yeah. we're going to head Oh, up. they're going to come up there and raise hell on your birds? Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun. Well, you That'll shoot him there and then track, and then he can come Fall back down, down to Montana and we'll beat him up again here. Just chase the same birds on yeah, the way down. Uh-huh. We need uh, everyone, too, to cheer him on at the NFR. Look for that Meteor logo. It's the only it's rodeo right athlete that has a Meteor logo on his chest bucking out. Yep. It's pretty yeah. cool. So cheer him top, on. Top right chest. When is the when, NFR? December 7th it starts. Yep. 7th to the 16th. 10 days. I'll know when you get off that horse. I'll know if you're waving that hat around or if you're kicking the dirt. (laughs) I'll know what happened. Uh, (laughs) That'll be my first indication of how the ride went. Yeah, (laughs) You'll be able to turn to the the person next to you and be like, so. (laughs) (laughs) Let me walk you through what Zeke's thinking. (laughs) That'll be my first indication. You'll get a celly or nothing at all. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We'll be on the live tour, so we'll be able to check in every night. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on and good luck. Hope you win. I appreciate it. Hope you don't get hurt. Yeah, thank you. All right, man. Take care. You bet.